At Zaxby's, we don't just make chicken fingers. We make the most premium tenderloin. 12-hour marinated, hand-breaded, fried to golden perfection. Deserves not one, not two, not even three, but your choice of 12 dipping sauces chicken fingers. Chicken fingers that you can dip, dunk, or drizzle in ranch. And Zach sauce. And spicy Zach sauce. And honey mustard. And tongue torch. And barbecue. And I'm out of time. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. Jersey. Isn't it about time for somebody's favorite radio program? Yeah. 97.3 ESPN presents The Sports Bash with Mike Gill. When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. I can't see him, but he talks to me. Now, live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. It's just after 2 on a Monday edition of the Sports Bash. Live, 97.3 ESPN. The 97.3 ESPN free mobile app streaming live video on the X platform at 97.3 ESPN. Use the hashtag SB Live. What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Mike Gill. Josh Henning is producing today's show. You out there. We've had a busy weekend. We're going to dive into the Phillies uh, kind of... um, taking care of business against the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, for whatever that's worth. They beat the Diamondbacks, beat them up on Saturday, uh, beat them on Sunday. They lost the game on Friday night, but uh, we can dive into a lot of the sights and the sounds from the weekend. Uh, Friday night, that Apple TV Plus game was the one game that nobody saw. Uh, I did figure out the Roku thing yesterday. It wasn't It wasn't too bad. It was tedious. I had to sign up for Roku. Um the one thing I couldn't figure out was how to cast it over to my main TV. I did figure out how to screen mirror. Um, you know, you, there's a way that you could just screen mirror your phone over to the television. The only problem with that is, you know, everything pops up on your screen. Text messages. I think Nick Earnshaw called me in the middle of the game and that popped up on my TV and all that kind of stuff. But if there was a way to cast it over, it would have been a little cleaner but overall, figured out the Roku thing. Um, I did. It did take me a little while. I finally just downloaded the Roku app to my phone. Then you have to make a, a Roku thing. But I could not find the app on the television. So I don't know why, because it did say if you had like an LG TV, which I do have, that you should be able to get the app, the Roku channel in there. But whatever, I found it. We ended up getting it on. And I saw the game yesterday. Friday night, I did not see the game. I do not have Apple TV+. Plus, and um, it was just too much going on to try to figure it out on Friday night. But that said, uh, the Phillies lost that game, so I didn't really care to see the Friday night game, honestly. Um, no, I, I mean, uh, overall, let's go back to Friday night real fast. That was the 5-4 game. Uh, Arizona, a couple home runs, and I think they had three home runs. And they do it against Taiwan Walker. After the game, Walker essentially gets demoted. Um, I don't know what to think of that. I mean, they're saying that he has a blister on his finger. And the way that they kind of described it was he has a blister on his finger and they will not activate him until this thing is completely, you know, it sounds to me as if this is like an arbitrary thing that I don't know that he was on board with. I mean, we haven't heard from him, but I can't imagine like, You know, the way that they kind of said it was, hey, we will um, (laughs) we will basically put him on the injured list. And when it's gone completely, we'll bring him back. He said, I mean, I think that's the problem right now. It's not there. And the last two years have been throwing it so much. It's kind of been my bread and butter, my go to pitch. So I read something and I don't know how you figure this out. But that he had the second best sinker in baseball when the Phillies signed him. Now he's got the second worst sinker in baseball in terms of accuracy and velocity. That's all stuff that's over my head. But that said, the Phillies are basically saying that Walker, you need to go take some, uh, go into the, to the timeout room. So he is out of the rotation after Friday night. He'll be replaced by Spencer Turnbull, who came in that night on Friday and threw three scoreless innings. So he'll be back in the rotation and he will be in the 
uh, rotation on Wednesday, I think, against his former team, the Detroit Tigers. So um, the, the, that was really the big news from Friday night. Real quick, if you go back to that game Friday, Friday night, it was a little disappointing because Jordan Montgomery has been terrible this year, and the Phillies didn't do much against him. Uh, Turner, three RBI on Friday night. Uh, Sosa had a couple of hits in the game. Castellanos had a home run. We'll get to him in just a little bit. Turner hit a home run as well. So you got a couple uh, storylines that started with that. But Walker was the big news from Friday. He went four innings, gave up three homers. And at the end of the night, basically, I think the Phillies decided, all right, we've seen enough of this act. And they put him on the injured list. That news was announced on Saturday. The game on Saturday... We'll quickly dive into that because Harper, um, he hit the home run, and so did Castellanos again, and so did Bone. Bones was an absolute bomb. Uh, but the big story was the Castellanos game. Two for three, five RBI, second home run in a row. Harper, though, four for five, three RBI. He hit another home run. And then the big home run from Bohm, Kyle Schwarber. Two for three with three runs scored. I don't really hear anybody complaining about Schwarber as the leadoff guy. It's, it's odd how that happens. He's hitting 258, which is as high as I've ever seen him. 382 on base percentage. But really, the other interesting part about that game, Wheeler, seven innings, eight strikeouts. He was masterful against that Arizona Diamondback lineup, which is not nearly as good uh, as we saw. Cor- uh, Corbin Carroll is um, is struggling this year. He's hitting like 210 on the season. Marte still been a thorn in the side, but Wheeler was able to shut him down. Um, and then you go to Sunday, the game yesterday, which, you know, the Phillies, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, Christopher Sanchez, there was another story over the weekend. Sanchez gets the contract extension, so he gets the contract extension one day. Then he goes seven innings, gives up just three hits, and look, he only threw 80 pitches in the game. He probably could have kept on going in that game, but as Rob Thompson kind of chronicled after the game that Alvarado and Hoffman hadn't had a lot of work recently because of how deep everybody's going into these games, so they had to bring in Alvarado in the eighth, and they brought in Hoffman, who got roughed up a little bit in the ninth. But Sanchez, what a story and fine this guy has been. He gets a four-year extension, and I think the Phillies you know, are wise to kind of lock him up at below market value. I mean, he's going to pitch the next four years. They bought out a lot of his um, controllable years and just said, you know what, let's just pay the guy – at a you know below market value value salary, if this guy keeps pitching the way he is, his ERA is two sixty seven. Sanchez, I mean it's unbelievable. Um, and him and Suarez, the two of those guys, like you can't account for that. Like where does that come from? You, you can't account for those two guys being like Cy Young. They're I mean, you're at the point now where how do you keep Sanchez off the All Star team? He's 5 and 3, so record-wise not great, but all of his other numbers are all-star worthy. Um you would make a strong argument that Suarez should probably start the all-star game. And then you got Wheeler and Nola who I would think are going to be in the conversation. I mean, you might get four Philly starting pitchers in the all-star game. I would think that Strom and Hoffman have a good opportunity to make it too. And then right now the voting just came out earlier today for where the Phillies are. And <laughs> I mean, the whole team is essentially the uh, the Phillies. I mean, Alec Bohm's going to start at third base. That's not even a question. He is so far and away the leader at third base. You've got, um, let's see, the latest updates. You've got Real Muto, <clears throat> I guess within striking distance of Contreras, but Contreras deserves to start there. Real Muto second. Harper is over a million votes up on Freddie Freeman, so he's going to start at first base. Marte is likely, uh, you got a pretty close battle there, Marte and, and Arise, but Stott's obviously the third guy, but he he doesn't deserve to be in the game. Bohm is, I mean, I don't, I, how the hell is Alec Bohm? He's got like over 1.5 million votes more than Manny Machado. Like, seriously, who is voting for Alec? I'm not saying that they, but like, I can't imagine someone in like Milwaukee or St. Louis or Colorado or Arizona or Cincinnati are sitting there voting for Alec Bohm. Like, he is just smashing the field right now. And then you've got um, 
Trey Turner, who's probably going to start at short because Betts will be out. And Schwarber is third in the DH uh, spot. But you can make a strong argument that Schwarber deserves to be in the game. But I can't imagine he would get named a reserve. And then the outfielders, Brandon Marsh and Nick Castellanos and Johan Rojas, are five, six, and seven. So you've got at least one two, three Philly position players, they're going to start the game. I would make a strong argument that there's going to be three Philly starting pitchers, so that's six. And then if you get a guy like Sanchez, that would be seven. If you get Strom, that would be eight. If you got Schwarber, that would be nine. I mean, you could potentially get ten Phillies making the All-Star game. That's unbelievable. The last time I remember anything like this happening was I guess like 20, was it like 2016 with the Royals? They had like the entire starting lineup was like the Royals. That team that won the World Series. They went to the World Series the one year they lost and then they went back the next year. I think they had like seven of the eight or eight of the nine. Uh, I was going to say seven of the eight, not including the pitcher, the the the, the position players. But I, I could have sworn the Royals had like an entire starting lineup filled of the All-Stars. But going back to the game yesterday, Boom two for three. Uh, he had the double. He's just been on fire recently. You had Harper two for four again. He had a double yesterday. But Castellanos yesterday, he had an RBI in the game. So now we go to Nick Castellanos. And look, um, and Dave Dahl, by the way, I'll give him a shout out. He had two RBI in the game. It was a pretty big hit in that game. But Castellanos, his average is up to 226. So we keep asking, why is he in the lineup every day? And listen, I don't think you can say that Castellanos and the team letting him just kind of play through this, give them credit. Well, sure. I mean, if he ends up pulling through the other side, it's going to look like. But I don't think we could look back and say, hey, if you would have given him a day off somewhere in there, maybe this would have happened earlier. And who knows? Maybe he is ready to go off on a hot streak. But I will say this. No matter what Nick Castellanos finishes this year at, he's at 226 right now. If he gets up to 240, that would be unbelievable. But even if he gets there, we all know what Nick Castellanos is. He is a streaky dude. And right now, he just could be in that hot streak. That said, he's not a guy that I can really count on. I can count on him to be when he's really hot. But I I need Nick Castellanos to be balanced a little bit more. It's great when you get this version of him, but the other version of him flat out stinks. So I think the Phillies still, they can't get sucked in by this version of Nick Castellanos. So shake his hand. Yo, awesome weekend, and I hope he's on a hot streak right now. But how hot's the streak, and when does it flip us back to the other guy? So that's the one thing I'm concerned and some takeaways from the Phillies weekend against Arizona. So according to MLB.com, Mike, the record, there's two different records, okay? The most all-star starters, not just players from your team, but starters, that is five. That was last year's Rangers, the 1939 Yankees, the 1956 Reds, and the 1957 Reds and 1976 Reds. So that's just starters. They all had five of the all-star starters in the game. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if the Phillies... Wait, 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 wait. So the Royals weren't on that list? No, the Royals, not the Royals. Well, it says here in 2015 they had five starters. Maybe five of their starting players in the all-star game. But according to this MLB.com article, they did not have five starters starting in the all-star game. You could have had five players starting for your team in the game. That's a completely different record. Mm -hmm. Because that record is owned by a few different teams where you would have eight of your starting players in the game. Uh, That record was most recently the Atlanta Braves 2023, Mm -hmm. where they had Acuna, Albies, Arcia, Murphy, Olsen, and Riley all in the game, but they weren't starting in the game. So that's kind of like the differentiation. All right, so, yeah, in 2015, they had eight All-Stars. Right. And I guess only five of them started? Not five Royals, because that would be on this MLB.com list here. 
I guess they didn't have five starters in the game, but they had eight of their players in the game. Yeah, eight guys from that team made it. Right. Um, I guess it was 2015. What did I say, 2016? You were close. It was 20, yeah, you're right, 2015. Yeah, the- See, this says only Mike Trout was preventing it from being the Royals' everyday lineup. I have to go back and look at that team. The 20, what was it? The 20? 2015 Royals? 2015 All-Star game. 2015 AL All-Star team. Yeah. I could have sworn that they had like seven starters in that game. For um, the Royals, but maybe not. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Well... What's this? Twenty? Oh no, that's, I got the wrong year. Twenty? How the heck did that happen? Twenty? What did I say? Twenty fifteen? Twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen. Major League Baseball All Star Game. Let's see. You had one Royal, two Royals, three Royals, four Royals, and so four start at the game. It looks like maybe the pitcher was the pitcher also a Royal. That would be five. I guess not. I'm pulling up the uh, 2016 to see if that's any different. Well, regardless, you know, uh, it looks like the Phillies, I would imagine, are going to have the starting pitcher. 100%. I guess, I I mean, something would, I mean, unless Suarez really, you know, has a terrible three-week stretch here, uh, I would imagine Suarez will be the starting pitcher. Uh, Harper, Bohm, and Turner look like they're going to be the uh, all-stars at their positions. So that's three. Four. You're probably going to get four Philly starters, I would guess. Three position players plus the pitcher. There's an outside shot, I guess, that you could get what other position? Any other one? Probably not. Maybe an outfielder? Nah. Doesn't look like it. I mean, unless Castellanos like, goes on a hot streak and he gains some votes. He's the only guy who play within range. No, he's of not voting. even behind, He's behind Marsh. But Marsh, I'm assuming, is going to drop because, you know. Right, I'm saying, but Marsh Castellanos isn't even the highest next guy on him. Marsh is over three thousand, three hundred thousand, uh, three hundred thousand yeah, votes over Castellanos. So Profar, Yelich, and, and Hernandez, they're going to be your. I mean, those guys all have over a million votes. Yeah. So I would imagine that unless people get hurt, Marsh and Castellanos will not get there. So you're going to get Turner because Betts is hurt. Right. Harper's way ahead of Freeman. Yeah, and Boehm is third. Boehm, Boehm is definitely starting. He's the one guy. Well, and Harper's over a million votes ahead. Yeah. So you're going to get three positional players plus the starting pitcher, I would imagine. So you can get four. Which is pretty darn good because sure. if, if the record is five, you're, you're, you're in pretty good territory. No doubt. No, listen, you get four uh, all-star starters. That's a, that's a, that's a, not, you know, and again, it doesn't guarantee anything, but uh, it is what it is. I now, mean, the question is how many more guys do they get into the game beyond the starters, as you said, because... Well, that's why I think they can get maybe six more. Well, the record is eight. So could they get eight? Could Mike Gill rationalize eight Phillies yeah. who in some capacity or another? Yeah, I'll give them to you again. Ready? Um, Harper won. Boehm, two. Turner, three. Suarez, four. Wheeler, five. Nola, six. Nola and says Sanchez? I, you didn't let me get there. Sanchez, seven. That would be seven. And then if they ended up taking either Schwarber, Strom, or Hoffman, all those guys have a could, I mean... You can make an argument for all three of them, Schwarber, Strom, and Hoffman. And now, yeah. Real Muto could be there, too, as the backup. Somebody has to be the backup catcher. The only thing would be... Is he healthy? Well, is he healthy, one. And two, is there a player from a lousy team where their best player is the catcher? Like the Rockies. Like last year, the Rockies had Diaz make the all Yeah, like game. Diaz would probably be, like, if you're only picking one Rocky... He might be the guy, and then that bumps Real Muto. Right. You got to keep that in mind. Right. That one player from every team has to make it. Yes. One guy from every team has to make it. So you're saying, all right, if I think Real Muto could be the backup catcher, is there a player from a bad team that gets on that list? And, and that would be the same situation with, um, well, second base, Stott doesn't have, a, he doesn't deserve to be on the team. And the other spot would be, 
maybe the designated hitter. No, Otani's going to make it. The other guy is Ozuna, and both those guys deserve to be there. But is there a is there a, a, a good player on a bad team? That's the hard part. Like the outfield right now, Profar, okay, there's a Padre. You get him in. Other than that, though, like Yelich is on the Brewers. Well, Contreras is already going to make the game. Um, so you that, that's the hard part about the Phillies getting all these extra guys who might be deserving. Right. Like for example, I could see a scenario where the Pirates' one guy is Paul Skeens because he's Paul Skeens. And he's having an amazing rookie year. Yeah, that's another story that they're saying, hey, the MLB has to find a way to get him in there because he is having an amazing season, but – he got a late start. Right. But I think his numbers are still good enough that even after the late start, you might say, you know what, he, he, we got to get him in that game. Listen, if he's not in the All-Star game, that's, that's a black eye for baseball. Um, he has only pitched in eight games this year, but, you know, his numbers are deserving. Now, you and can make the argument. He starts by the time the All-Star game comes around. You can make the argument that his teammate, Mitch Keller, deserves to be there, too. And you can't take most likely two pirates. Most likely, no. Um, I'm just wondering. I'm, I'm just trying to think of different teams that are not great teams. Like Ellie De La Cruz is probably going to. I mean, he's having an okay year. But I well, mean, right now he's the third shortstop. So right. if Betts is out and Turner is the next highest vote getter, Turner would be the starter. You can say De La Cruz would be the backup. Right. So he would be the Reds guy, for example. I'm just going through like the bad teams in my head. You know, you mentioned the Rockies with Diaz, the catcher. Maybe he's the guy. Well, who gets that's in. the thing. There's only two National League right now bad teams: Colorado and Miami. Everybody else is is, is within three games of the playoffs, so there aren't really any bad teams. I'd have to figure out who the who the player on the Marlins would be. Yeah, the Marlins guy is going to be tough. Um, as a position player, I don't know that they have. You got to find a pitcher, I would imagine, and it could. It's probably like that's your situation where you might just say, "Hey, find me a guy who's been a relief pitcher, like a Matt Strom. Like who's that guy on that team that's just having a really good year?" Because they don't really have. A- Tanner Scott has a one six four ERA. This year, and he's got uh, thirty five strikeouts and thirty three innings. Right, he's your he's your bullpen guy. He's not a closer. I mean, he is a closer. I he guess. He has nine yeah. saves. Yeah, the yeah, team yeah. is so bad. They don't have a lot right, of right that his numbers. Yeah, so he'll be the guy there. I, I wonder. Scott. Yeah, so Scott would be the guy, and then the Rockies need a guy. So really quick, so if you put Tanner Scott in the game, for example, that takes one spot away from the Phillies bullpen. Well, if example. you take Tanner Scott, that means that's a that's a bullpen arm that maybe a Matt Strom doesn't get in the game. You can only take so many relief right. pitchers who aren't closers. Now, Scott isn't, but I'm saying, you can't just take a random middle relief pitcher from the Phillies if you've already got eight guys on the team. Correct. When you have to try to find, because you got to try to, well, um, who would be the Rockies guy? We said the catcher might be the guy, Diaz. He would be the, pos- he, he would probably, like, he made it last year, right? Did he win the MVP last year? He won the MVP last year. I was going to say, I, I kind of, why do I remember uh, the the Rockies guy winning the MVP last year? <laughs> because but, it was so out of nowhere. That's why. You were going, like, if you were to go on your sporting bet app and bet on who's the MVP, he was probably like plus 20,000. Yeah. Well, he's having a year where he's hitting over 300 right now. So you could make an argument that, okay, we can put him in the game. They have a couple options, actually. Uh, the shortstop, Tovar, McMahon, the third baseman, who are both having okay years. They're not like jump off the page and grab you kind of years. But both of those guys have numbers that I guess they could be the representative. And then I guess you would say, hey, is there a Rockies pitcher that is deserving? And that's always hard to find. It's very hard to find a Rockies pitcher that would be uh, would the be the guy. Pitcher with the best ERA right now is Cal Quantrill with a three five. So yeah, not not exactly all star looking numbers over here. No, have. but uh, that was the weekend uh, for the Phil. So there you go. Uh, the, the the Sanchez thing. Uh, he signs the deal. He pitches a great game. Now he puts himself in you know candidacy. You think Sanchez deserves to be an all star over Nola? Yes. I think while Nola has a, a a great whip this year, 
I think that you can't underplay the fact that Sanchez has consistently been pitching better than Nola. I mean, he he right now, Mike, the number is that he has gone the most innings like giving up a home run since Roy Halladay. Yeah, he's only given up one homer all year. I mean, if you have done anything for the first time since Roy Halladay, that's got to be all-star worthy, right? Suarez is a 175 ERA and an 089 whip. Sanchez is second with a 267 ERA. Wheeler is third with a 273, and then Nola 354. Wheeler's uh, excuse me, Nola's eight and three. Sanchez is five and three. The whips are uh, Nola 106, Sanchez 128. So Nola has a better win, more wins, and a better whip. But Sanchez has the better ERA. The strikeouts are interesting. Uh, 70 for Sanchez, 84 for Nola. And Nola's pitched 10 extra innings, even though they've both pitched in 15 games. Yeah, Nola actually has the fourth most innings pitched in the National League this year. Mike McGarry from the Press of Atlantic City, pressofac.com. We'll take a look back at the weekend. Frank Close has his Phillies mailbag today. Special edition on a Monday. Stick around for that. I'm Mike Gill. This is the Sports Bash live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app and Streaming live video on the X platform at 973 ESPN. Use the hashtag SB Live. You're listening to with Mike Gill. And it just keeps getting better. On 973 ESPN and the 973 ESPN free mobile app. 232, Mike McGarry from the Press of Atlantic City, Press of AC.com. The Phillies with a successful weekend yet again. Christopher Sanchez gets a new deal, then he wins the game, and then Taiwan Walker gets placed on the injured list. We got that and more as the Phillies head to Detroit to take on the Tigers. And uh, even though the Phillies had a good weekend, Mike McGarry, they weren't able to extend the lead. You know, the Yankees and the Braves played. You thought maybe the Yankees could help out, but not so much. Braves have won 8 out of 10. They sit seven games behind the Phils, and that's where it was when we spoke on Friday, Mike. As uh, Phils, though, they get a little bit of revenge against Arizona, but I thought the, the story of the weekend was really a couple things. The Sanchez deal first. Let's start there. He gets that deal, and then he pitches a great game. But, man, where has this guy come from? Yeah, exactly. He's come from, no- He's come from nowhere, right? Absolutely nowhere. Um, you know, he, last year he's kind of an afterthought. They turn to him in June because they need a fifth starter. He comes through, and now he's pitching as well as any starter in the National League and has a $22 million contract and yesterday turned in a standout outing and really pitched like a bargain. Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at things that have to go your way to have a special season, finding a Suarez, and then on top of that, getting a Sanchez, I mean, those are two things you can't account for at spring training, really. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and Sanchez's development really is remarkable. It's a remarkable story. The Phillies get him from Tampa. He's a hard-throwing, you know, thin lefty, weighs 6'5", 160 pounds, doesn't know where the ball is going. Uh, you know, somehow refines his control, develops a changeup that is one of the best changeups now in all of baseball, and has a 2.67 ERA, third best among all National League starters right now. And you lock him up through possibly the year 2030, giving you some core certainty and some foundation for the rotation. So it really is a remarkable story, and you're absolutely right. If you're going to be you know, 51 and 26 and have the best record in the National League and and the second most wins in all of baseball, you got to have a sort of Christopher Sanchez sort of fall out of the sky for you. You sure do, and he's been outstanding to the tune of just one home run, Mike. He's given up one home run all season long. I mean, you almost by accident give up a long ball, and he's only given up one. I mean, that's those are the type of things that you're like, you just can't f- account for. And then what Suarez is doing, those two guys. Uh, but you got a chance to see Wheeler as well this weekend. And, you know, it's amazing to say that you can almost make the argument that Wheeler's been the third best guy on the staff so far this year. Yeah, I mean, at times you could say he was the fourth best guy, which is really crazy. Uh, You know, or you could say that 
you know, Suarez and Sanchez have over the past couple of weeks outpitched Wheeler and Nola, basically. Yeah, the the strength of this Phillies team is its starting pitching. They put out a guy, let's say, four days a week or four out of the five guys, because I'm sure we'll get to Taiwan Walker next. But they put out a guy on four of those five days who you know is going to really shut down the opposition and keep you in the game and give you every chance to win the game. And not only are those guys great regular season pitches, they also have a track record of postseason success, especially Wheeler and Suarez. So it's almost like when it comes to pitching, the Phillies have the best of both worlds. Mike McGarry from the Press of Atlantic City, pressofatlanticcity.com. Uh, you wrote about the um, Walker decision. Um, I don't know. Read the tea leaves on this. Will we see him back? Is this a demo- is this just their way of just saying, "Hey, we need to move on from you"? How do you see this all playing out? Yeah, I, I don't see them. Look, I don't see them giving up on him at all. He's in the second year of a four-year, seventy-two million dollar deal. If this is the fourth year of that deal, it'd be a different matter. This is a guy that won 15 games last year. This is a guy, although he got hit hard on Friday night, this is a guy who didn't pitch that badly against the Mets in London, didn't throw that badly in Baltimore. I think what you're seeing right here is he has not been able to throw his splitter, which is his go-to pitch. He threw it 33% of the time last season for whatever the reason, be it this blister, hot spot, inflammation. They're saying that's why they can't throw it. I think they put him on the injured list to give him time to sort of catch his breath, refocus. Maybe there's something wrong with him mechanically. Work on his mechanics without the pressure of having to make his next start five days later. Almost allow him to reset himself confidence-wise. I think you'll see him back, but he's obviously going to be on the injured list for 15 days, and then he'll have rehab starts and stuff like that. you got the all-star break in there. So I would suspect maybe you'd see him you know, end of July, beginning of August, in the meantime, you're going to give Spencer Turnbull a, a chance to pitch. And if Spencer pitches the way he pitched early in the season, six starts, two and one record, 1.67 ERA, that's going to be a nice problem for the Phillies to have. You know, what do they do when Taiwan Walker says he's healthy enough to pitch? Yeah, uh, it, it's amazing to see the whole pitching thing kind of materialize here. And, and as you mentioned, the Walker thing, we'll see how that all plays out. Offensively, it was kind of the Nick Castellanos weekend. I don't know what to buy into this, Mike. My opinion would be, uh, I, I know what I can't count on Castellanos. I don't care how rip roaring hot he gets. It's great if he get he's two twenty six right now. Even if he gets himself, let's say he's up at the two forty five by the end of the year, that means he was ridiculously hot. But I know that he can be ridiculously hot. He can also be not. So I don't know if I take anything from Castellanos because I know this. I know I can't trust him. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, all base play, all baseball players, all hitters are streaky. He's very, very streaky, (laughs) and this is who he's been all his time here in with the Phillies. He's been absolutely terrible, or he's been red hot, and to me, this is who Nick Castellanos is. You're right. I can't trust him. All we can do is cross our fingers, cross our toes, if you're a Phillies fan, and hope he's hot in October and stays hot for all of October, unlike last year, where he was hot for half of October (laughs) and ice cold for the second half. This is who he is. He's a streaky hitter. Uh, he's going to be out there. They're not going to go away from him. Like I said, just just cross your toes and fingers if you're a Phillies fan and hope he's hot come October. Well, I, I guess the next question, and I think we all know the answer, but can the Phillies get creative and say, look, we know what this guy is, and we know we can't count on him? I mean, does it get to that, and they may, that's the big move, or they just get, can, you know reserve to the fact that he's here, we're paying him, and we just better hope that he's hot at the right time? Yeah, I mean, look, I think when we look at what the Phillies might do at the trade deadline, I think we all say right-handed power bat in the outfield. We all say uh, another right-handed arm for the bullpen, maybe a guy with closing experience. I I don't think that outfield bat comes in and replaces Nick Castellanos. I think Nick Castellanos is in the lineup. I think if you're looking for that right-handed power bat to come in, I think that's a guy who comes in play some left field and sort of takes over, you know, the uh, 
Whit Merrifield, uh, Kristen Pache sort of role mm -hmm. out there, basically. Uh, that's where I think that, that power bat slides in. I think you're going to have to live with the Castellanos ups and downs for the rest of the season. Well, give me your thoughts on the rest of the outfield. Uh, Marsh against lefties. It seems that they don't want to play him there. Uh, is a platoon with Marsh and Pache and Merrifield and Dahl going to get it done in an October series? Yeah, I think you're going to need another player. Uh, again, I don't mind the March uh, Pache, and I'm not giving up on Rojas. Maybe Rojas can go down to AAA. He had a good week last week, shore up his defense a little bit, come back and contribute the second half of the year. Uh, Marsh was given an opportunity to hit some lefties early this season. It wasn't a large sample size. But he just didn't get it done. And sometimes, you know, when you're trying to win a pennant here, it might be 15, 20 at-bats. And if you don't seize on it in those 15, 20 at-bats, which he definitely did not do, uh, they're not going to run him out there against lefties. So I can live with – what I'll say is I can live with one of those platoons. I can live with the Marsh Pache uh, – you know, platoon in center field, but I'm not so sure I can live with the Murrayfield Dow platoon if that's going to be the case in left field. I think you've got to upgrade, uh, you know, one of those two platoons. I'm okay with the center field platoon. I like Marsh against right handers. I like Pache's defense, but you know, if you're going to have that platoon in center, I don't think you can live with Murrayfield Dow. Again, to me, you've got to go get a right handed at, uh, at bat. And then you can maybe put it out there with Dahl in left field and platoon like that. But I can't live with both of those platoons, just one of them. All right, Mike. Um, I don't know if, where you are on this yet, but we're going to start seeing more of a platoon at second base. Yeah, I mean, I'm disappointed in Bryson Stott. You know, he's played excellent defense right there, but he has not hit the ball well uh, all season long. Now, he did have the hit yesterday. He did have the big hit last Tuesday when they rallied against the San Diego Padres. They were down 3-1, I think, in the eighth inning. They came back and won that game 4-3. He had a big RBI in that game. Like I said, had the RBI hit yesterday. I I I'm going to play it out with Bryson Stott. I'm not going to platoon. Maybe against tough lefties, I'll, I'll put him on the bench, put a right-hander up there. But I just think his his swing looks too good. He's got too much potential. Uh, I'm not going to give up on him yet, but I think you're absolutely right. I'm disappointed with his offensive season so far. He has taken a step backwards offensively. Defensively, he's been great, but offensively, he's yeah. not getting the job done. And I'm going to have to see more of him. Now, I'm going to give him a chance. He's 25, 26 years old. I think he can be a key part of this team going forward. I think you almost got to play it out. But there's no doubt that so far as we sit here towards the end of June, he, you know, he's been disappointing. Hopefully, he can turn it around. Yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, the, I guess the thing, the thought is, you know, with Turner back, how do you get Sosa enough playing time? Um, and, and and short of saying, hey, you're going to play in a platoon at second base, uh, getting these the Merrifield Sosa, they're kind of duplicitous players. How do you get them all the playing time? It's going to be very interesting to see how they figure this out. Yeah, I, I, somebody's at bats are going to have to suffer. Now, maybe yep. you you take some at bats away from Stott that you would normally give him, but I'm still going to run him out there 85 percent of the time. You know, maybe you can you know give Alec Bohm a day off here. Maybe you got to give Turner. Turner mentioned the other day that he's kind of not being cautious, but he's just being careful with his legs, his hamstrings. So maybe you know day night day game after a night game or a couple days in a row, you got to get Turner off, you get Sosa in there. Again, I I thought Sosa was great, but again, I'm not going to get overboard on Edmondo Sosa. I think Edmondo Sosa's career has shown us he's better off in short doses, and I don't want to overexpose him too much either. Mike McGarry, Press of Atlantic City, PressofAtlanticCity.com has a lot of Phillies coverage the rest of this summer. It could be a special season we're watching here. They beat the Diamondbacks two out of three and of course 51 and 26 they are seven games up on the Braves in National League East play Braves kind of creeping back in this thing hey they were uh look like they were kind of down and out and now they're making their push we'll see what kind of moves they make as the trade deadline will be the next big thing right after the all-star break Mike we'll talk to you Wednesday man all right, we'll see you down the road. Thank you. All uh, right, Mike McGarry from the Press of Atlantic City, pressofac.com. And, of course, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays with us right here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app, and streaming live video on the X platform 
at 973 ESPN. Use the hashtag SB Live and you can find the show pretty easily that way. I'm Mike Hill, and of course, I got a deal for you. Bring any written estimate for a new 2024 Acura from any Acura dealer right over to Key Acura in Atlantic City, and my friend Rocco will beat the price by $500 and give you an additional $500 on your trade. It's a pretty sweet deal when you think about it. All you got to do is get a written estimate. If that says $25,000, well, you're getting $500 off that car. And between now and the end of the month, June 30th, get a 36-month lease on a 2024 Integra for just $299 a month with $49.95 down. That's everything, tax tags, doc fees, you name it, all those crazy numbers that you hear. That's the number, $49.95 down. Your payment's $299 a month. Key Accurate, Tilt Road EHT. You're small, but friendly dealer. I'm Mike Gill, and coming up, Frank Close has his Phillies mailbag on a Monday special edition. Monday, Kevin Pelton, ESPN, on what the Sixers need to do to nail their offseason. Plus, Mitch Koff is coming. Durso at 3.30 today, our Flyers insider from 97.3 ESPN.com. Com. It's at Zaxby's, we don't just make chicken fingers. We make the most premium tenderloin. 12-hour marinated, hand-breaded, fried to golden perfection. Deserves not one, not two, not even three, but your choice of 12 dipping sauces, chicken fingers. Chicken fingers that you can dip, dunk, or drizzle in ranch. And Zach sauce. And spicy Zach sauce. And honey mustard. And tongue torch. And barbecue. And I'm out of time. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. Mike Gill. And I am the voice of the voiceless. On 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. 253 on the Sports Fast. Frank Close answers your Phillies mailbag questions coming up tonight at 3 o'clock. Kevin Pelton from ESPN. How can the Sixers nail the offseason? That's at 5 o'clock tonight. Kevin Durso, our Flyers insider from 97.3 ESPN.com, will give us the latest on... Mitchkov coming to America. It looks like uh, this thing's going to happen. He's getting out of the deal in Russia, which is a weird situation. It's a weird story on why he's getting out of the deal. I guess they. I guess when we think of Russia, we don't generally think of compassion, but uh, that's the reason why they're being compassionate. And his father passed away recently, and I guess the team over there decided uh, to show some compassion and said, we're going to let you out of the contract two years early, by the way. When the Flyers drafted Mitchkov, they knew they weren't going to have him for almost three seasons. And they said, this guy is that good of a player, so we'll take him because the Flyers are kind of in the middle of like a rebuild and figured, you know what, what's the difference if we don't have him? We're not a Stanley Cup contender now. But does that move the timeline up considerably? We'll ask Kevin Durso in 40 minutes from now. Stick around. The Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. and streaming live video on the X platform. Use the hashtag SBLive to find us there. But when we come back, Frank Close from 97.3 ESPN.com, our Phillies insider, has a early edition of the Phillies mailbag, as Frank will be away tomorrow so we said hey why not do the mailbag on a monday with so many phillies questions popping up we'll have frank close answer them coming up next here on the sports bash i'm mike gill we got frank close our phillies insider stick around that's next on 97.3 espn this is the sports bash with mike gill on 97.3 espn and the 97.3 espn free mobile app now live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. 3 o'clock, Sports Bash Live, 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app, streaming live video on the X platform at 97.3 ESPN. Use the hashtag SB Live. The Phillies mailbag, Frank Close. Taiwan Walker placed on the 15-day DL. Sanchez gets a new deal. And who's going to take that spot? Talk to Frank Close from 97.3 ESPN.com now. 
as he joins us a day early for the mailbag, but a ton of questions following a weekend against the Arizona Diamondbacks, and he joins us now on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. What's going on, Frank? Not much, Mike. How are you? All is well. Uh, a successful weekend, I guess, per se. Friday night, a little wonky uh, as they lose that game uh, um, uh, with um, Arizona, but they come back 12 runs on Saturday, and uh, really the pitching performance on Saturday and Sunday was the story, right? Uh, but I guess the big story starts off with Taiwan Walker going on the injured list, so let's start there, get your perspective on uh, this Walker injury and kind of read the tea leaves on what's this going to mean big picture. Well, for the Phillies, of course, Taiwan Walker, he's been – He's been their fifth starter. He, he gives them a lot of innings. You know, that, that is probably his biggest contribution to the team. I know his ERA isn't been, hasn't been wonderful. I know he hasn't necessarily dominated like the others that he's in the rotation with. Uh, but, you know, there, there are a lot of innings that they have to make up. Now, uh, Spencer Turnbull, who pitched very, very well in the early season when he got the opportunity to make some starts, he's going to slide into that rotation for now. And replacing him in the bullpen is Michael Mercado. Now, He's a name you might not know a lot about. The Phillies just picked him up in a minor trade with the Rays in the offseason, and he's been pretty near dominant at uh, AAA Lehigh Valley. Uh, he's mostly been a starter. Uh, they kind of were kind of scaling back his innings. Um, in fact, only his last couple starts did he go five innings and six innings, respectively. But before that, they held him back to like three or four as he was working as a starter, and he pitched very, very, very well for the Iron Pigs ERA. I think it was one seven one. So. Uh, he's going to get an opportunity to go into the bullpen. Now, he, he pitched most recently on the 18th, so he's kind of a ready arm in the bullpen. And then considering that uh, Turnbull replaced Walker on Friday night in that game where Walker left a little bit early, uh, he'll line up to make that start on Wednesday in Detroit. Yeah, so obviously now um, you're going to have to make a decision on Walker. Maybe they're pushing back the inevitable. Do you think uh, that Walker will be coming back in the 10 days, or do you think this will be like a prolonged absence here? Well, this is a 15-day IL for pitchers, so I, I think he would miss a couple starts, maybe three, and then I think he'd be right back. You know, they, they didn't think at first that it was a big deal. I, they mentioned it almost like it was just a little something small in his finger. Something like that probably is healing quickly, you know, if I'm assuming, you know, but they might they might want to give him a break. If you remember last year, they gave him a little bit of break during the season to try to uh, try to get him to work on some of his issues slash keep him keep him rested. So maybe maybe they'll give Turnbull a few starts and then uh, go back to what their current plan was, which is to try to limit Turnbull's innings so that he can help them more down the stretch. But I would imagine that, that Walker's going to, enter the rotation just after those two or three starts that a 15-day span would, would cover. I know James asked a question in the mailbag about Walker. If he was on another team, would you trade for him? I think we all know kind of the answer there, but I guess you could throw it around. Would teams be interested in trading for Walker? You know, I, 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 I'm probably not in the majority here, but I, I think, yes, he does provide value to certain teams. And, and for me, it's not because – He's going to help a team in the front of their rotation down the stretch into the playoffs, but teams need starters that can give them innings. You know, I think back to the 2016 and 2017 Phillies. You know, they paid Jeremy Hellickson a nice amount of money each of those years, actually not 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 much differently than Walker is making now, uh, and he really got that rebuilding Phillies team some innings so that the, the the pitchers that they're trying to break into the major leagues weren't overwhelmed. So, you know, I could see a team and, and the Phillies might need to eat some money to do this, but if down the line, and I don't think it would happen anytime soon, because again, the Phillies could probably benefit from those innings for now. I could see a team that's perhaps rebuilding want that stability. And, you know, if Walker has two more years on his deal after this one. Could they find a home for him, especially as the Phillies seem to be locking in all their starters and they have some, some fresh blood rising up in the system. You know, I think they could make a deal if they needed to make a deal. But I, you know, I think I think we need to remember, Mike, that he's a fifth starter. What does a fifth starter do? Try to, if they're successful, try to give you some innings. Try to mostly keep you in games. Uh, and I think Walker, for the most part, has done that, even though he hasn't been outstanding. Yeah, and obviously the, the the tough part for the Phillies is that Walker hasn't been great, and the guy who replaced him was very good. That's the problem. It's not like you know 
in the past, you know, last year, uh, people were complaining about Bailey Falter, but they didn't really have another option. And then, of course, Sanchez got the opportunity and kind of grabbed it. But, you know, Falter was terrible as the fifth guy last year, but every other guy they, 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 they tried was just not very good. In this instance, they tried another guy out of necessity, and that guy performed. I think that's what's making it tough for the Phillies optically. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. But, you know, Turnbull's got, got a really interesting story. I think one of the things that that's going to make this start against Detroit in Detroit next week so interesting is that last year, while Turnbull was injured, the, the, the Tigers tried to send him down to the minor leagues. And ultimately, like, they went to court and the league overturned his minor league option. And so he got a full year's salary and service time against the Tigers last year. But, you know, so he's got this he, – last year was a, a big adventure for, for Turnbull. And I think right now with the Phillies, they, you know, they look at his history. He had some injuries, hasn't pitched more than 56 innings except in 2019 when he started for pretty much the whole season for the Tigers. I think they, they recognize he's pitching well, but they might see that arm giving them more value down the stretch when they need him perhaps more than right now where you can get away with somebody else making the starts. Now it's hard it's hard to say, hey, he's pitching great, you know, uh you go into the bullpen, but uh but you know, I think they, they do see value in him. In fact that's why they picked him up and you know it was kind of one of those wild cards. You know, when the Phillies signed him, Kobe Allard and you know they they brought in a few veteran guys for relatively cheap amounts of money. You know, they were just hoping that one of them would work out and help the team and, and he certainly has done that so far. Uh and I think they really want to make sure that he is with them down the stretch. So they, you know, they, they did, they did move on from Walker <laughs> letting him pitch uh, a couple times, you know, during the season, as I mentioned, and then into the playoffs. So I think they want to rested uh, Spencer Turnbull. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's not pushed too hard right now. Frank close 97, three ESPN.com Phillies insider since 2016, answering your mailbag questions here. Uh, before we get to some more mailbag questions here, um, Give me your thoughts on the whole Castellanos. He's obviously scorching right now. He's had a really nice stretch here, but I think we know how this story ends, right? I don't care how hot he gets. I feel like we know that the lack of consistency will pop up at the worst moments. Yeah, uh, that, that's the story of Castellanos. At the end of the year, is you know, for example, I saw someone post, oh, well, since June 1st, he's He's hitting 269 with four home runs. Well, if you were in that series in Baltimore and, and he was hitting in the two hole, you just watched him go over those series. And, you know, that that's the story of Nick Castellanos. He has moments where he's pretty low, and then he has other moments where where, where he's killing it like he has in the last week. So I, it's just something you got to deal with with him. I think that's why they like to hit him seventh and, and not have him be one of those core bats in the lineup. So if you're all healthy – Having that guy hitting seventh isn't that bad a thing because he's going to be the one that steps up in certain moments when you need him. And, and yeah, he's going to go over four and swing at everything other times. And, uh, but I will say this, the, the Phillies have been working with him. You know, you've seen Kevin Long working with him on, on a couple of tweaks to his swing and, and, and he's getting the credit for that, at least to the organization right now for this little turnaround. So we'll see how long Castellanos can keep this up. Frank, uh, let's get back into some of your mailbag questions here over at 973ESPN.com. A lot of pitching questions. Um, we just saw uh, the Phillies extend it, Christopher Sanchez, but Fred wants to know why did they do that? He wasn't going to be a free agent anytime soon. They had a lot of controllable years here. So was it a smart decision to buy out all those years? You know, it's pretty interesting. The Phillies were not actively pursuing this. It was a matter where Sanchez's agent called the Phillies and said, hey, you know, Chris Chris is interested in working out an extension. Is there any way we can do this? And uh, and as Dave Dombrowski told at the press conference, he said, hey, look, you know, we don't really like to do this during the season, but if something could come together fast, let's see if it can. And, you know, for a guy like uh, Sanchez, you know, he's kind of been on the bubble. You know, when the Phillies traded for him, he was this guy that just threw really hard and was all over the place. In fact, even... Even last season when he had a nice little season, and even, to be quite honest, going into this season, you weren't really sure what you had with him. Now, was he the guy that, that had no control and threw hard, or, or was he becoming a pitcher? And I think after last season, you, you still had some doubts, but right now he's really become a pitcher. Uh, you know, I expressed concern about the Phillies' depth or the concern of counting on him to be a starter. And boy, is he delivered at this point. So, you know, after Sunday, 5-3 and three with a two six seven ERA. You know, those trio of Phillies starters leading the league in ERA, um, but you know I, this this was a this was a 
special thing in that, you know, someone like Sanchez looking to, to, to have that life-changing money, like, lo, you know, really wanting to have that stability. And he asked for it. They got something together quickly. And for the Phillies, if he keeps pitching like this, this is going to be a bargain. I mean, those, those last couple arbitration years can be a big deal. You know, in terms of uh, figuring out your your budget and, and how much money you have to fill other holes, so this gives the Phillies some cost certainty. And it's only twenty two point five million dollars, according to Matt Gelb of the Athletic, over the next four years. And the Phillies also got a couple of option years on that contract to take it to twenty thirty. Mm-hmm. You know, and those two amounts being fourteen million and fifteen million. So it's one of those things where if this works out, uh, the Phillies have a bargain potentially. Although. There might be some escalators in that if he ends up finishing in the, the top few of Cy Young voting and such. Uh, we, we don't know the specifics of the deal, but um, but yeah, this this could be a real bargain for the Phillies. And you know, it, it's just amazing, Mike, that you know, a couple of years ago, you're thinking, oh man, you know, Wheeler's going to be a free agent, Nolan's going to be a free agent. Uh, who do you have behind him? And uh, and right now, you see, they have three pitchers that are locked up to help anchor this starting rotation for a few years to come, and then more talent in the system. I mean, the Phillies are in an envious position right now around baseball. No one ever seems to have enough pitching, and the Phillies took advantage of this opportunity to to lock a young guy up, and you know it could pay dividends in the future. I mean, this is still less money than. Scott Kingery got before he played a day in the majors. Yeah, I was thinking of Kingery because he's the last guy I can really think of that got all those arbitration years bought out, and that didn't go very well for them. Uh, this is a little different because Sanchez has done it at the major league level, albeit uh, not for a, a long amount of time here. What, what I do want to ask is, what does this mean for Painter, Abel, McGarry, and, and the younger pitchers here? I mean, you got Wheeler. You've got Sanchez, you've got Nola, I imagine, and, and one of the questions in the mailbag that we'll get to is Suarez. Um, what does it mean for the young pitchers in this organization? It means nothing. They continue going along their, their journey of trying to become a major leaguer, and if they force their way in, they force their way in, and you deal with that embarrassment or riches when you have it. So, you know, I think one thing about baseball, you know, prospects are prospects. You don't know which way they're going to go. I mean, if you think back to – Oh gosh! Remember Spencer Howard a couple of years ago? Was he was he the untouchable, right? And then Sixto Sanchez, he's untouchable, right? You, you know, you always have these these top prospects, and and you're lucky if they hit. And uh, you know, having a certainty at the major league level, I think, is more valuable than than expecting those guys or counting on those guys. And let's be honest, I mean, McCabe's had a little bit of a rough go in his first year at AAA, so you know, it's going to take a while. I don't, you know, for me personally, I don't like to assume that any prospects are going to be a guarantee in the major leagues. And mm-hmm. so if you've got talent, lock it up and keep it in your organization. I mean, the best thing for a team like the Phillies, who has some financial power, all it costs them is money. You know, it's not like it's much worse when you've got to then trade your prospect capital to go acquire pieces that you don't have. So I'm, I'm all for I'm all for just if it's just costing money, spend it, keep them in your organization, keep more talent than, than you don't have. And just just let it work itself out. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wonder, I guess the follow-up to that would be, because um, a big picture here, I, I don't know how much longer you can keep going with this outfield the way it is. I mean, sure, you can get through the regular season, but big picture, can you really have Pache and Marsh platooning and Dave Dahl and, and Merrifield platooning and an inconsistent Castellanos? Like, do you have to put it under the microscope and say, look, this is getting us through the regular season, but to really win the World Series, we're going to have to get more consistency out there. And we have a you know a plethora of younger arms that just don't have a spot. Can you utilize them to really get a bigger, uh, more consistent outfielder? You know, I don't know you need to use it for that. I mean, I, obviously, if you're another team and the Phillies have a couple pitchers in the top 100 prospects, they're going to be asking about them if you're getting into trade talks. But the Phillies have other prospects, too. You know, I think uh, – I think I think if you're the Phillies, you know their their past administration said this. It never really worked out. But if you can if you can work if you can grow the arms in your organization and hold on to them, then you can just pay money for bats. And so there'll be a team. I, I think I think the Phillies are just to be clear. I think the Phillies will add an outfielder. I mean I don't think I don't think you know David Dahl, even though he's had his moments, is a sustainable option. And Whit Merrifield probably shouldn't be starting right now. So. I think at least one outfielder's come on their way. I don't think they need to dip into their pitching to do it. I mean, they may choose to, depending on what the options are out there. But, but yeah, you know, I would I would not be wary to trade a, a Mick Abel. Andrew Painter, I might still hesitate a little bit if I'm the Phillies just because he's, he seems to have such a high ceiling. But, 
Um, but if, if I'm the Phillies, I would I would try to I would try not to trade the pitching capital if I had the opportunity to, to trade some of the bats instead. Yeah, we'll see what uh, Dave Dombrowski ends up doing here, uh, and let's get back into the mailbag questions. As uh, Mike wants to know, do you think the Phillies will? or are able to extend Ranger Suarez. I mean, they got a lot of money uh, on, in the pitching. They got some money out there. But is Suarez a guy who's having just enough? I mean, he's going to be the starter, I would imagine, in the All-Star game, right? Uh, are they going to be able to extend him? I, You know, I think I think they will. Here, here's the thing that we've seen the last few years, right? Big-time pitching in Zach Wheeler, big-time pitching in Aaron Nola. They've found the ways to sign these guys. And I think they have a couple things going for them, the main one being – Players want to be in Philadelphia. You know, that, that's half the battle, right? And, and even when Aaron Nola hit the free agent market, it still became an issue of, okay, well, I'm a free agent. I've got offers from other teams like the Braves, but what, what will it take to get me back in Philadelphia? And I think, I think there's no reason to, to, to be pessimistic that if the Phillies want to re-sign Ranger Suarez, and, they've, and Dave Dombrowski openly said so in that press conference for Sanchez the other day, it's hard to believe that, that if there's that mutual interest that they're not going to get something done. Now, um, as I mentioned a little while ago in terms of Sanchez, they usually don't like to do deals during the year. Uh, Jim Bowden of of SiriusXM, the former GM, he actually just said he heard that the Phillies are working on a deal with Sanchez. Uh, But, you know, I think think at the season's end, you know, we still got one more year of control after this. That's a good time to do it. And, you know, I think uh, he's certainly increasing the amount of money he's going to get by pitching this well this season. But, no, I think I think we've learned what Ranger Suarez is. He's just somebody who's very calm and measured, and just really executes on the mound, and and just takes his time and makes sure that that he throws a good pitch every time. And and I think that yeah, he would be in demand on the open market. But I think too, you know, as we saw with the other pitchers, I don't think he's eager to get out of Philadelphia. And 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 Mike, if they can sign him too, I mean, imagine having four starters of that quality. Uh, locked up for a few years. You're, you're going to feel really good about the Phillies for a few years to come. Yeah, and I, uh, you feel really good about them right now. What's your over-under for All-Stars? We were counting earlier. I mean, we can make a strong case for 10. I don't think they'll <laughs> get 10. Uh, where do you where do you? Because th- I, I, you figure, well, you know that it's going to be Harper, Bohm, and I would guess Stott, I mean, not Stott, uh, Turner, I guess, is going to get elevated to the starter with uh, Betts being out. So you're going to get those three. Then I guess you could make a case for Suarez, Wheeler, Sanchez, Nola, Strom, and Hoffman. But I can't imagine they all make it. Yeah, they, they, it's a matter of numbers, right? Every team in the league is going to need to have a player. It's there's going to be some there's going to be some real snubs this time. I, I would put the over under at five, and I and I, I tend to I tend to think that that logistics could even make it under five. And who gets who gets snubbed? I mean, probably the relievers that don't have large numbers of saves. Uh, I think that would be my concern for for the on terms of Jeff Hoffman and, and Matt Strom. Uh, could Zach Wheeler get snubbed again? Maybe I don't know, but I mean, he certainly has got the numbers to back it up. Yeah, this is going to be a time where you're going to see some snubs. And, and why? Because even the Miami Marlins have to find somebody to put on this team, and that unfortunately means somebody who's worth more worthy of it isn't going to get the opportunity. And so, yeah, I'm going to put it at five, around five. All right, it's Frank Close, 97.3 ESPN.com. The Phillies and the Tigers renew their long-storied rivalry today. Uh, they'll have a three-game set out there. All these crazy uh, interleague games when you get a, a, an NL East uh, playing an AL Central team. Uh, Tigers 36-41. and 41. Uh, It is... Um, a uh, little Monday through Wednesday, and then the Phillies. Uh, after that, the schedule gets kind of interesting before the All Star break. Here, we'll dive into that a little deeper. But Phillies and the Tigers tonight, and of course, Frank Close over at ninety seven three ESPN dot com has the Phillies mailbag each and every uh, Tuesday. We had him on a Monday today here on the Sports Bash. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Mike. All right, man. Frank's back next week. Uh, Aaron Nola, by the way, pitches tonight against Casey Mize. Uh, who's a right-handed pitcher. I did not see the Phillies lineup. Let me do another quick check on that, uh, see if we got the Phillies lineup out there. Nope, no lineup as of yet for the Phillies. They are in um, Detroit. So is that a 640 start out there tonight? I think it's a 640 start for the Phillies in Detroit. Um, real quick, because they're playing Detroit, and it's kind of a meh, you know, um, team on the schedule after this it does get a little interesting 
They play Miami for four. So you were thinking they're playing a Detroit team that's meh. They're playing a Miami team that's awful. And then they play Chicago for 4th of July. 4th of July, they're going to be at Wrigley Field, by the way. Then they play Atlanta and the Dodgers. So you got the Braves and the Dodgers. Bang, bang, back to back before the All-Star break. They got Oakland in there uh, to finish off the first half of the season. But you've got a couple series where you can start getting some separation and then you got Atlanta and the Dodgers. They're going to be two really cool series. Uh, that is July 5th through the 11th. Back-to-back Atlanta and the Dodgers. So keep that in mind. Sports Bass Live, 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Streaming live video on the X platform at 97.3 ESPN. Coming up, Mitch Cobb is coming. What does it mean for the Flyers We'll discuss with Kevin Durso from 973ESPN.com. He's actually on vacation, and he was saying, I know the Flyers are going to do something while I'm on vacation. Well, four days in, they finally did. You know, the Flyers, with this move, how much has it changed your anticipation for the season? We asked you that over at 973ESPN on our social media channels. It's also our question of the day. It's funny. I was surprised by some of the answers here. Uh, Sean chimes in. He says, absolutely, but he's a rookie and young, yet he still needs time to develop his game, and people need to temper expectations and understand this reality. Okay? Uh, Gil chimes in. Not me, but somebody else named Gil. Says the Flyers need a complete overhaul, starting with their uniforms and logos. Sounds like a guy who's just not very happy with the direction of the organization. Chris says, nope, this move does nothing for him. For the season. Glenn says, yes, of course, but please temper those high expectations of him being a savior. He's a kid. Be patient and grow with him. That's a very measured answer by Glenn. Rick says, of course it does. Great news for the Flyers. Okay, I like that. Um, Fred says, depends on the rest of the roster. Could be adding a Ferrari to a bunch of rusted out Pintos. (laughs) They almost made the playoffs last year, Fred. Uh, Chris chimes in. He says, no, while he's a talented player, he's also a wild card. Let's see what happens next season. If he can put up generational numbers like he's been touted, I'll get excited. But until then, I'll remain neutral. So a lot of Flyers fans tempering their expectations with Mitch Kopp coming over. We'll get the lowdown from Kevin Durso from 973ESPN.com. And he'll tell us what kind of expectations the Flyers should have now. Now that it is official that Mitch Cobb is coming to Philadelphia. That's next. You're listening. At Zaxby's, we don't just make chicken fingers. We make the most premium tenderloin. 12-hour marinated, hand-breaded, fried to golden perfection. Deserves not one, not two, not even three, but your choice of 12 dipping sauces chicken fingers. Chicken fingers that you can dip, dunk, or drizzle in ranch. And Zach sauce. And spicy Zach sauce. And honey mustard. And tongue torch. And barbecue. And I'm out of time. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. With Mike Gill. Never thought this radio stunt would catch on so big. On 97.3 ESPN. Three thirty Sports Bass Live, 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app on Mike Gill. Well, it sounds like Mitch Koff is coming. What does it mean for the Flyers and how did this all happen? Kevin Durso. Our Flyers insider from 973ESPN.com. He's actually on vacation, uh, but this story was just so big that Durso said, the hell is my vacation? Let's get it all broken down right now here on the Sports Bash Live on 973ESPN, the 973ESPN free mobile app and streaming live video on the X platform. Kevin Durso, now where are you? You got a beach background there. What do you got, a little water? Uh, actually, the World Showcase in Walt Disney World. Nice. All right. Well, it looks like a beautiful day uh, where you are right now. Blue skies, a little water background. Uh, but this story really trumped everything. I mean, the fact that this is going to happen. Now, we talked about a month or so ago that there were some rumors, and we wanted to hear more. How did it get to the point where it is now looking official that Mitchkov will be a flyer this season? Well, this was always kind of the timeline. We had kept hearing about this 
end of June deadline to find out what was going to happen, whether it was going to be this year or whether it wasn't. And it really lines up the fact that it's June, you know, June 23rd was yesterday. That was when the report started coming out that this was going to happen. There's nothing been officially announced yet by either side of this thing. So we don't have an official announcement of the termination of the contract in the KHL. We also don't have an official confirmation of an entry level deal from the Flyers, but that all kind of seems like more or less a formality because it just seems like with that, if you're lining up everything else and knowing the situation, knowing that there was a possibility this could happen, it sounds like this is going to be the case. And if not by the end of today, then maybe earlier, you know, early in the course of this week, the next day or so, you'll actually see the official announcement that this is done. And the goal at that point would then be, you know, if it's possible, maybe get him over in time for development camp in, in another week, which would be great. It would definitely draw a crowd at the uh, Flyers training center in Voorhees. But otherwise, the main goal is training camp, the, the main training camp, and getting him here for this season if this is the way it's going to go. And it sure is looking like that right now. Yeah, I mean, he's 19 years old, and I'm, I'm a little intrigued. We asked a question on social media whether this changes your excitement or expectations, and people have been a little measured, a little, little say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, how would this change the team's outlook for the upcoming season if he's here and it looks like he will be yeah i mean the outlook is going to still be kind of what it is they're still in a rebuild he's one player he's not going to make the whole team but i do think the excitement level should be up i think the flyers really need this honestly i think they need somebody during the, the kind of the the lean years of this rebuild that brings some attention in place if, you know i kind of compared his situation to eric lindros back in the day and when Lindros debuted as a flyer, the team wasn't on the verge of being a contender or anything like that, but it gave you somebody to come to watch every night. He was a player that had that talent level, would give you those kind of performances, and you really wanted to see what he was going to do. And I think the same thing's going to be the case with Mishkov, that you have a player who warrants the attention, who is somebody you're going to find out what he's got every single night. You're going to want to see it. And I don't think it changes expectations for either the team or him, to be honest. Like, curb your expectations for him, too. He'll be a 19-year-old rookie in the NHL turned 20 in December. And curb your expectations. Don't go crazy with it. He's got a long career ahead of him if everything goes the way it should for him and the path he's on. But it certainly should amplify your excitement level for the team just to see a player of this caliber and have a guy be on that younger scale of, of potential star. Yeah, um, so let's talk a little bit about it on the night where there's a Game 7 that is surrounded with a lot of young players that have elevated these franchises. Uh, what type of prospect are we discussing with Mitchkov here? Can you kind of uh, put it into words or comparison to some of the players uh, in the in the league currently? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you start to think about the Russian players that kind of qualify in his in his realm or, or what his potential level could be. You think about it, an Artemi Panarin type. He, this is a winger. This is a guy who's got goal-scoring potential. So I think you kind of draw comparisons to him. I've seen people draw comparisons to Nikita Kucherov as well. Like, you're talking among the best of the best. You're talking about the guys that are perennial all-stars that get Hart Trophy nominations, things like that. Like, his potential is that high. And that's the exciting part. He's obviously got to deliver on that. He seems like he's a very level-headed kid. He seems like a kid who wants to seize every opportunity he has. He wants to be the best in, in, in everything he tries to do. And I think that that really makes a difference. The attitude that this kid has is going to go a long way in his ability to deliver on that, to be that kind of player. So if he wants to reach those kind of lofty expectations, he's going to have to put in the work, but he seems like someone who's definitely willing to do that. And I think that's a, that's a great step for the Flyers to have a player who's kind of that cornerstone material coming soon. Um, what does that mean for the rest of the offseason now? Uh, Briere spoke the other day. You wrote about Briere over at 97.3 ESPN.com. What do you think it now would mean to the rest of this uh, this offseason? I don't think it changes a whole lot, to be honest. I, first of all, they don't have a lot of free cap space, so it's not like they're going to be big players in the free agent market unless they were to do something very creative trade-wise. Uh, I think more than anything, and I kind of the way I kind of alluded to this is that so if Mishkov is your kind of elite playmaking winger and can turn into that, now you start to continue to look for the avenues that get you that top-line center who would play with Mishkov, uh, that, that true stud defenseman that would be at the top of your defensive pool, you, you know, you're still kind of, you're kind of eyeballing goaltending as well because every team that really makes a big run has good goaltending as well. And you hope that you have something in place with some of the guys that we've talked about over the last several weeks with Arison and, and Fedotov and Kolosov, guys like that. But you start to continue to look for those steps. And 
I think one of the things that this does is the, the NHL draft is this upcoming weekend. I think it makes Danny Breer a lot more likely to potentially take a swing again, just like you did with Mishkov, to go for a player that may be, you know, high ceiling, but have a little risk attached to him as well, because you know what? It might be worth it. It may be worth it in the long run to take that swing and figure out, you know, what can we piece together here? Can we get that level player? Because we wouldn't be, if, 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 if Breer wasn't willing to take a risk, we wouldn't be talking about this, you know, today. We wouldn't be talking about a player of this potential level, and you would have gotten another maybe run-of-the-mill guy at seven instead. They got a player at seven last year with this potential ceiling of talent level because they were willing to take a chance on him being willing to come over here at some point. They were willing to wait out the whole thing, but but you kind of start to connect the dots that Danny Breer kept saying, if there is a way, we'd love to have him. And, you know, there's a part of his Thursday, his press conference last Thursday where he was asked about it, and he kind of got this wry smile on his face that in hindsight – looks like, hey, I knew something you didn't know yet, and I maybe I knew all along this is going to happen, and I'm just holding it in because I can't speak yet, but when it happens, I'm going to be really excited. I got this player in my back pocket ready to come and join my team. Right. Um, so if that's the first domino, do you think that the draft will show us more dominoes to tip over? Are they aggressive on draft night? Uh, possibly, but in a different way than I think people would be thinking. I don't know if they're going to be as necessarily as aggressive in their selection. There's a lot of different ways that this could go after the first overall pick of it's going to be Macklin Celebrini who's going to San Jose. That's pretty much a given. After that, it could go a bunch of different directions. And it's really tough to say whether or not there's going to be a similar prospect to Mishkov who falls to that kind of level at seventh overall. That being, or at 12th overall, if they stay there, their 7th overall has been talked about, 6th overall has been talked about. There's a lot of picks that have been out there, and that's kind of, I think, the thing where the aggression could come in is, do they make a trade on draft night to move up? I think that would be, and Breer has talked about that being on the table, that if they can make it happen, they would love to. If they can get back into the top 10, I think that would be huge for them if they could find a way to get a player they really have their eye on that maybe is the second domino of this. I think that's where the aggression could be. And let's not forget the possibility of them making a trade that involves players too. I mean, they've got a lot of different ways they could go with this. I think one of the biggest things of this offseason was figuring out whether or not this was going to happen because if it wasn't going to happen, I think maybe you play it safe for a second and, you know, take a little bit of time, let some things kind of even out. They've talked a lot about salary cap money and how they have to let some of this dead money come off the books before they can really be aggressive. Maybe this changes your approach and you find a player you feel like you can be a little bit more aggressive about. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, on draft night. Yeah, I mean, been... uh... Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, indications that they might want to try to get into the top five and do something there. You mentioned some players on the roster. If, are there any players on the current roster that you might, uh, if you were that guy, you, you would probably be listening to see if your name is being mentioned? Um, a couple probably, yeah. Um, yeah, so a couple players, I would say Scott Lawrence, Are you being told Lawrence. that you have to move? No, I'm, I, I got a couple seconds. Um, it's, it, it is what it is, you know. Trying to find a small, a quiet spot here is not easy. Yeah, what are you um, with, like, uh, Epcot Center and, like, German music playing yeah. in the background? Is that what's going yeah, on here? Uh, I think this is Italy, actually, so it's the, it's the Italian pavilion. <laughs> um, either way. Um, so, yeah, Scott Lawton's probably one name's going to come up. You're going to hear a lot about Travis Konechny over the next several weeks, even though I think that their goal is to keep him. You know, Konechny's one of their most valuable chips, so I think that's going to be a way to go as well. Um, that if they, you know, if they decide to, whether they decide to keep him, whether they decide to move him, he's a guy that could be possible. I think you're going to hear Joel Farabee's name a lot too. So uh, that's a couple of options there. All right. Uh, Kevin Durso on vacation, uh, Epcot <laughs> Center, Italy. Uh, we'll let you get back to that as uh, Mitch Kov looks like he's coming over. If he doesn't go to the uh, prospect camp, that doesn't mean that, I mean, he's good. If he's over here, he's going to be on the NHL roster, correct? I would have to imagine so. They don't want to have it. First of all, that's part of the, I think that was part of the potential contingencies of him getting out of the rushing contract was he better play NHL and not go to the Myers. The most I can see being involved with that is if cap is a question, then they might have to paper move him to the AHL for a day and then get him back up once they do whatever they have to do to be cap compliant. But he's coming to play in the NHL, no question about it. All right, uh, Kevin Durso. More over on our website, 97.3ESPN.com. All right, man, enjoy the rest of your vacation. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Kevin Durso covers the Flyers for 97.3 ESPN.com. And, of course, uh, so the top prospect is uh, Matvey Michkov. He was drafted last year, number seven overall. Most people thought he probably would have been a number two overall pick had he been committed to coming right over. 
the original plan was that he was going to be over in Russia for three seasons. So the Flyers said, you know what, we'll take the guy, he's the best player by far, and we'll just, you know, grin and bear it for a couple of years. And, you know, we're not ready to go and be a real contender for that long anyway. Now, as Kevin kind of chronicles here, does this move your timeline up? He said it doesn't really change the timeline much. But it was, it does is give the team some excitement of a player. Like, even though the team was solid last year, I mean, they were just a – it was a good team. It wasn't a great team. They didn't make the playoffs. I mean, you don't make the playoffs in the NHL. How good are you? So it was a surprising year. They had a winning record. But they weren't a playoff team. You get a player now that makes you want to watch. Like, if I were to say – what player did you want to see on the Flyers last year? There just wasn't a guy that you were like, ah, I got to make sure I see Travis Konechny play. They don't have that guy. It's been a while since they've had that guy. Like, even Claude Giroux, as good as he was, you weren't just mesmerized by watching him. He wasn't a guy that, like, that you had to, you know, stop what you're doing to watch. They're hoping this player is that guy. That, hey, you're not that much of a hockey fan. But, like, tonight, Game 7, and you can listen to Game 7 tonight on 97.3 ESPN. Uh, We will have Game 7 for you, 7.30, the coverage, 8 o'clock, Edmonton and Florida. It's a Game 7 in the NHL, and it's a historic night. Either Florida's going to win their first Stanley Cup, uh, or Edmonton's going to come from 3-0 down and win for the first time a Canadian team will have won the Stanley Cup in, what, 30 years, I think? So tonight's a historic night in some capacity in the NHL. The Flyers have not had that player that Edmonton does. You know Connor McDavid. You know who he is. If you're not a hockey fan and you don't watch any hockey, you've probably heard of Connor McDavid. That's what the Flyers are hoping they now have, is a player that will have the magnitude that those guys have, right? They have not had that player in a while. And from what many people have told me, that this is not the first, uh, this will not be the last move for this team, that they are working their way to try to become extremely relevant again. And it could start on draft night, as Durso hinted at. Um, there's been a lot of buzz that I've been told about them moving into the top five. That could be the next domino, right? We got this guy. Now let's go get a top five player. And then, as Durso just said, they do not have the cap space this year to be a big player in free agency. So I wouldn't imagine that you're going to see them. Um, I, I, You know, you're not going to get involved in, in any of the, the top players in this year's uh, free agent class, I would imagine. You're, you're probably not um, monetarily going to be able to do so. Well, part of the problem is is that Cam Atkinson and Ryan Johansson, they're, they're entering the last year of their contracts. And I know Durso has talked about this at 97.3 ESPN.com in the past, which is the Flyers have a decision to make. Do do they keep these veterans who they have money invested in, or do they try to move off of those guys and maybe change up the roster? They This Mishkoff move to me, Mike, could be the domino that pushes them in a certain direction that maybe they weren't planning on otherwise. Yeah, and I think they add him this year. They see what this team looks like. And then the next year's free agent class is where they get involved. Right. Maybe this year is more of like a, a retool, a recalibration. Well, this year is more of, hey, we got the player early and... We have to respond accordingly. Well, it's now added excitement to our fan base. Mm-hmm. So this year we'll get by with the excitement that this player brings. But after seeing him play and others in the league seeing him, we're hoping that it's good enough to attract that next-level free agent to come here. We'll see. Uh, Thanks to Durso for taking time out of his vacation to stop by the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. Uh, Jeff Mosher has football at 4 coming up in 14 minutes from now. Stick around. That's coming up here 
on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. At Zaxby's, we don't just make chicken fingers. We make the most premium tenderloin. 12-hour marinated, hand-breaded, fried to golden perfection. Deserves not one, not two, not even three, but your choice of 12 dipping sauces chicken fingers. Chicken fingers that you can dip, dunk, or drizzle in ranch. And Zach sauce. And spicy Zach sauce. And honey mustard. And tongue torch. And barbecue. And I'm out of time. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. Once I heard him give me this full itinerary, I was like, all right, Billy's going to be there no matter what. Yep, he got there about three. Earnshaw was like one of the first people there. Yeah. He brought the ice. Beautiful. Yeah, Earnshaw said, you guys need anything? Brought a, a three bag or four bags of ice. Wow. Yeah. Schwein showed up with a bag of ice. Wow. Yeah. So we were saying is I'm a loser because I didn't bring anything. Well, I said to Schwein, hey, because ice was at a premium. It was at a premium because it was so hot. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we have, but now we have all these bags of ice left over. But good party. There you eat, go. Did you eat enough? I probably should have eaten more, yeah. but I I think I did good. Well, most of the food was gone. At the end of the day, most of that food was gone. Sausage and peppers were really you good. You missed the uh, karaoke portion of the night. I did miss that, yeah. Yep. My friend Matt was on the mic. Oh, there you go. That was a sight to see. <laughs> <laughs> Football for with Mosher. It's coming up next. ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Just hungry to bring back another Lombardi to Philly. Uh, uh, The fans deserve it. Our team deserves it. Uh, Culture begs for it. Now live, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It's brought to you by Bet365. Whatever the moment, whatever the sport, it's never ordinary. At Bet365, Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast is here. And, of course, you can get that on all podcasting platforms. And, of course, their YouTube channel. Just search Inside the Birds as we take a look at uh, the Eagles heading into training camp. We are less than a month, less than a month now to Eagles training camp. They will begin. Players will report July 23rd. Well, today is June 24th. We are officially inside a month, Jeff Mosher to training camp. What's up, buddy? How you doing, Mike? May it be the longest month in the history of months, of time altogether. No, I'm actually excited. I get excited. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a team that uh, it's been all over the place. Uh, and one of the big stories this offseason is Kellen Moore, um, you know, is the new offensive coordinator. And how much of a th- of his, you know, finger is on this new offense here. Uh, Jeremy Fowler, ESPN this weekend, said that, you know, Nick Sirianni's putting a large amount of trust in Kellen Moore to handle a lot of things. And I wonder what that exactly means. You know, what does it mean that, hey, I'm going to trust you with the offense here um, because I know we're going to look at some of the things that we should be, you know, kind of positive about. You guys talked about on the podcast, but is Kellen Moore's offense one of them? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, we did on our on our podcast about concerns going into the season talk about sort of the potentially volatile mix between two different um, coaching philosophies, right? Uh, and because they're, they're, you know, Nick Sirianni comes from the old traditional West Coast tree, and and uh, Kellen comes from a more of a spread with a little West Coast that he learned from Mike McCarthy. But it's a little bit there. There are made some big differences. And um, but I, I would think in general, as long as there is harmony and um, as long as things go according to plans, that one of the benefits of having the offense handed over to one guy or the, the offensive coordinator is that the message will be trickled down from the start, that there won't be any interruptions or interference from other guys doing things. And then the extension of that, Mike, is that I think that if you look at where the Eagles are really strong and what they need to do better at. Obviously, picking up blitzes is huge and fresher out concepts, but I think they need to get back to using the middle of the field a little more. I think that's where some of the staleness came, Um, not just the route concepts, but the over-reliance on throwing the ball outside the numbers or deep and not using that middle of the field. I do think that if you go back and look, I know that if you go back and look at offenses that Kellen Moore has presided over, middle of the field has been... Um, big throwing to the running back is big Uh, if you go look at Keenan Allen's receptions last year I mean that guy was on pace 
to catch so many, like a ridiculous number of balls. I mean, he was catching like eight to 10 balls a game and he was lining up mostly as an inside receiver in their 11 personnel. He would play outside in 12, but when they went to one tight end, three receivers, they would bring the, you know, the, the kid they drafted out of TCU would play outside then Palmer, uh, Trey Palmer, uh, I forget the, the speedy kid they have, um, Guyton or Palmer, either one of those on the other outside. And then they would move Keenan Allen in the middle. So there's an opportunity I see here for Kellen to come in and say, all right, you know, maybe I can move Devontae Smith sometimes into the slot and play Paris Campbell outside. He's more of a natural Z Paris Campbell anyway. Um, maybe, you know, I'll get the tight end influence my offense and I'll just get the quarterback and the interior receiver on the same page. We've talked about the depth there not being great, but it doesn't mean you can't use any of your th- your top three receivers and line them up inside every once in a while to create yards after the catch. Well, they're talking a lot about motion and uh, some of the other stuff that uh, Dallas Goddard had said. He says, quote, I feel like it'll play in favor of the tight end. The quick game a little bit, getting back to the pivots, the sticks that I caught earlier in my career that went away a little bit. So he's saying a lot of the stuff that he was successful with, they kind of got away from. I wonder how much that has to do with the two wide receivers they have. But he said, I'm really excited for how he – he, being Kellen Moore, uses the tight end and how he feels like they could be a big part of the offense and help win games. I think that's another, you know, I know Andrew wrote about uh, that he's, you know, kind of primed for a bounce back season. But I think we kind of almost forget the weapon that Goddard is and can be. Yeah, he can be really um, he can be unlocked in this offense if it's going the right way. Now, the one thing is teams don't just get away because they forget. Like, we like to we like to think they do. Like, oh, you forgot to run the ball. You know, Andy Reid never right. We must forget. No, no. Um, the reason why most times teams get away from something is because the opponent has game plan to take it away. <laughs> and they haven't yet made the counter adjustment. So I don't think that uh, when, God, when Dallas says, you know, we got away from it last year, I don't think he means to say, like, yeah, we probably should have called that play or certain route concepts more it's just that they it wasn't there for them they've got to figure out a way to make it go but whether it's using more rpos again or more quick game or or attacking what the defense is now showing them differently to be able to use and exploit different parts of the field that that's the counter adjustment that we always talk about that they have to make now um we talked about things uh reasons you know to not be so optimistic when you were here uh last week some concerns but what are some of the things that we should be optimistic about and are the coordinators starting with Kellen Moore part of that I think the coordinators are, but I, I I look at the defense, Mike, and well, I think it's fair on offense, as we talked about last week, to question just how easy it will be to blend these two different offensive minds and ideologies and get everybody on the same page. Defense, you have zero concerns. I mean, the core, they've already been running a Vic Fangio style defense for a couple of years now. Now you've got the action. You don't have the template. You've got the guy. You got yeah. Vic Fangio. You've got a defensive line coach and a secondary coach, uh, defensive backs coach and a safeties coach who all coached under Vic Fangio. So you're not worried about the message being carried out or how it's being um, articulated in the classrooms. They're all on the same page. The foundation's there. And I think that's a big part of it. And then I think, you know, and we talked about this in the podcast today as far as reasons for encouragement. The Eagles last year finished I think 31st in third down defense. I believe they were 30th in red zone defense. We know that they were last in passing touchdowns allowed or or close to last. They were a bottom three to five team in some really important situational categories. And part of that was the confusion, right, that we all saw last year. But a lot part of it was, was talent and the fact that, as Greg Cosell would tell us on the show, It was hard to find a secondary last year or a back seven even less athletic, less dynamic than the Eagles. Well, you look at it now and you know, Quinion Mitchell is going to get on the field. The guy ran a four, four, three, 40, uh, Cooper to Jean, incredible athlete. He's going to wind up getting on the field for sure. Sidney Brown, very good athlete has to come back from his injury. He'll get in there on the field. CJ Gardner, Johnson, Mike sorely missed last year has a playmaking ability about him that Kevin Bayard no longer had when he he was with the team last year. So if you take just the, and the fact that you're not going to have James Bradbury, I'm still standing on that ground that James Bradbury is not going to be a part of the team. If you're, if you're just taking those three guys that I mentioned, right. 
CJ Gardner Johnson, well, four, CJ Gardner Johnson, the two rookies, the Gene and Mitchell, Sidney Brown, uh, Darius Slay still playing at a decent level. And even at linebacker, I'm not sure that's much better, but I will say Devin White's probably a, is definitely a, a way better athlete than anybody they had at that position last year. So I do believe, Mike, just naturally upgraded your di- your speed, your quickness, your talent, your dynamic ability there to the point where you, nobody should think the Eagles are going to be a bottom five pass defense or situational pass defense. Now, you know, they may not be top five, top ten, who knows, but I, they're not going to be as their current, unless, unless things go south, Mike, I can't imagine them being the embarrassment that they were last year. Yeah, I mean, that's a big t- t- change, and I know, um, you know, a lot of people looking at that safety spot, Chauncey Garner-Johnson, Reed Blankenship, Sidney Brown, are they going to, you know, is that an area where they might look to add something uh, at that one spot there? I know a lot of people looking at Eddie Jackson, Simmons, do you bring that veteran guy in who knows? Because kind of going back to what you said, they have the guy who runs the defense. These are players who have been in that defense. So you can kind of take your time, bring them in later on, and they won't have to go through a full like Bayard last year. You know, he was in three different defenses in three months. Yeah, yeah, that was rough for him. <laughs> the bear, the Bears certainly ignored that and figured that they would take a shot on him. You know, gave him, I think an eight million a year uh, deal this year. Uh, so uh, yeah, no, I do think that that it's a it's an area that Howie Roseman will look to upgrade, but I believe he just sensing how he's acted in the past. He's probably going to see how this thing unfolds for a few weeks of camp first. I mean, last year he didn't wait that long, right? Last year, a linebacker after I think like a week of practice, he, he called up both Zach Cunningham and miles Jack and said, please, please get in here. You know? Um, and then miles Jack wind up retiring, but Zach Cunningham wound up being one of their better linebackers. And, but, but you see how he didn't wait long to make that call. And we'll see how long he goes, before you might feel the need to do that at safety. All right, uh, we're looking at some things to be optimistic about. Let's uh, let's stay on the defensive thought here. And, and, you know, we talked about Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio. But the secondary in general, I, I would think that that as a whole, I know Isaiah Rogers was saying that he thought this was the best room that he's been in so far. People looking at Roger, There's so many guys in that room that aren't getting enough, you know, uh, attention because there's just so many of them there. But if you're looking at something to be optimistic out, I guess it's got to be the back end has got to be better than last year. Well, you would think depth, which has been, I mean, first of all, the Eagles have not had two good cornerback starters together at the same time in 20 years, right? I mean, going back to like Lito and, and Sheldon. So, now you've got that, it, you know, I'm going to go ahead and assume it's going to be Quinn Yon. I know a lot of people are just loving the idea right now of Isaiah Rogers and Slay. I still think it's going to be Quinn Yon Mitchell, but we'll see how competition unfolds there. But Mitchell and Slay, your starters, your, that means your backups are guys like DeGene or Isaiah Rogers or Kelly Ringo, a fourth round pick who came on in a little bit at the end of the year. That means the Eagles actually have depth at that position. I mean, last year, they at this time last year, they're hoping Greedy Williams was going to be like your top veteran outside that he didn't even make the team he didn't even make it through halfway at camp so so i mean it just goes to show that um the eagles have really paid attention obviously to that position in the last two off seasons and they've really tried to turn it over here yeah uh, there's no question that um i would think that there will be a different story jeff in the secondary almost every day at training camp i would imagine someone different will stand out almost every single day in terms of a corner or a safety and i don't know how they're going to figure out which guy stays and which guys go oh uh, yes that's what that's why vic fangio and his merry men are here that is their decision to make but remember you know, training camp's a big, it's a big fool sometimes, right? Like last year, you come out of training camp, the top backup cornerback outside is Josh Job. He had a great camp, really good camp, made the team, he's a good special teams player. And it was like five weeks in that Job became Eli Ricks. And then five to seven weeks after that, Eli Ricks went to Keely Ringo, right? So Training camp can tell you one thing, but the season can tell you a whole other story. Yeah, oh, there's no question about that. And I know that um, everybody, there used to be Mr. Lehigh uh, was the wide receiver <laughs> every year. There was somebody there. I would imagine Mr. Novacare will be <laughs> some cornerback almost every single day. Uh, all right, Mosher, pick out something else uh, to be optimistic about uh, with this team as we get ready for training camp less than a month. 
Something else to be optimistic about is, well, um, it's funny, we didn't talk about this a lot on the pod, but I think we might have mentioned it, though. I mean, I, I was uh, one of the few people, well, not one of the few, I, I was among the people who was not a very big fan of the Marcus Mariota signing last year. Uh, when it happened, not even just mini or tra- just when it happened. I just felt like I had watched a lot of Atlanta games the year before for some reason, and I, I thought he was not a very good quarterback. Um, I think that there's better upside with Kenny Pickett here. Uh, I thought he had a you know, decent camp from, from all indications. He'll have to – all the quarterbacks struggled a little bit because they're learning a new offense. But I, I think with this offensive line, which we expect him to still be very good, or at least good, um, Kenny Pickett has a better chance. These weapons, especially that he's got, if he has to play, he's got a better chance to have some success and reestablish himself and, and also to help the Eagles win some games – than Marcus Mariota. Yeah, Mariota um, obviously uh, didn't work out, didn't play all that much, but uh, having Pickett here, everybody thought that was an interesting move to make for Pickett. They also got uh, Will Greer is here, a guy who knows the offense, and who was you the guy they drafted? West Virginia guy in there, didn't you? You, you just you couldn't <laughs> help yourself. Who, who was the guy they drafted last year that they like? Hunter McKee. Tanner McKee. So that'll be something uh, to keep an eye on as well. Let me, uh, would you say there should be optimism about the running back room. I mean, yeah, you know, we did talk about what Saquon Barkley can give this offense. I I don't think he's going to be a bell cow. I don't think he's going to average like 24 touches a game, but I think, and I'll, I credit DeAndre Swift. I thought he did a good job last year. He showed he can actually be a higher volume carrier. He had less receptions than we expected and more carries and he had a good year. Uh, I, I think Barkley can add a little bit more explosive element, and that's hard to do because DeAndre was pretty explosive himself, but we know what kind of athlete Saquon Barkley is. And because he's on a team – see, I don't buy into the whole I, – I, I love – I mean, fans love to say, well, he's going to be on a way better offensive line, and so you're going to see a totally different Saquon Barkley. I don't really think that makes as much of a difference as people say it does or want to believe that it does. Why is that? Just, Josh Jacobs, two years ago for the Raiders, had almost 2,000. Did he have 2,000 total yards? You have to go back and look at Josh Jacobs' year a couple of years ago with the Raiders. Um, well, let me let me uh, throw another a counterpoint amazing, to it. Let, right? me, the let me throw a counterpoint to you on that, the Jacobs one, which is a good point because the Raiders don't have a great offensive line. But right. they have more weapons than the Giants do. Two years ago with the Raiders? Didn't they have uh, – or, or did Adams just get there this year? Was he there two years? Yeah, no, uh, Adams was just there last year. Okay. You'd have to look at the 2022 Raiders with, like, no qu- – I don't even remember who the quarterback well, was. Well, probably this. Carr. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was Carr. Um, Carr played 15 games, right? And uh, maybe they did have Adams. 2022? Maybe they did. Yeah, Either way. Adams was there uh, in 2022, yes. Right, and is that the yeah? That's your uh, Jacobs at 2053 yards. Right. Yeah. So, so my yeah, point is, you got Adams. Hold you on, hold on. You're feeding into my point. My point is, it's really not about the offensive line. It's about the environment. So I think Barkley having AJ Brown to your point and Devonte Smith, who are going to command a lot of attention. I think he'll see some some opportunities to make huge game, like really explosive plays, because it's not going to be like seven or eight guys just keying in on him like Giants opponents were. So people like to make it about the offensive line. And I, I'm just saying that it's more to me about the environment that Saquon Barkley is than the offensive line. Because we've seen plenty of good running backs be able to still be good behind bad offensive lines. I mean, if you're a good running back, you all you need is your lineman to stalemate and make some space. If you're good, you bust through the hole, you break some tackles. Uh, I think Saquon can improve in that area vision, breaking tackles, things like that. But there will probably be five or six times a game because of the defensive attention to everybody else, Goddard, right, Brown, Smith, where he may not have to. He may just run through a crease and get you at 25 to 30 yards. Yeah, I, you know, the running back thing is tough because Barkley got paid so much money. You're just wondering what do they have planned for him at that dollar amount? Yeah, but but Mike, to say you asked your question was less about Barkley and more about the running back room. If if Barkley, who is frequently injured, gets hurt, it's hard to look and say uh, yeah. Kenny Gainwell, Will Shipley, and I don't know maybe a Ty Davis Price, who I'm intrigued by, or Lou Nichols, or or the uh, the kid they brought in, I, whose name I can't remember. They brought in some bigger. 
bigger running backs. But, like, you know, without Saquon Barkley, this room is not going to wow anybody. Uh, Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. Their latest podcast takes a look at reasons for optimism uh, around this team. A lot of it stems around, look, and I agree, by the way. Like, if you said, like, I, I addressed this last week. I said the Eagles never came out and addressed what they thought their problems were last year. They didn't have a an end-of-year press conference and say, our coordinators were not ready for this, and therefore we replaced them. But mm-hmm. by them replacing them, I think that the actions spoke louder than words. And I tend to agree with them that they have upgraded significantly, and that's probably the biggest reason for optimism. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, it's it's more so the pedigrees, the fact that these guys have been coordinators before. Vic has had a lot of success. Now, you need talent. You know, if you go look at Vic Fangio's record as a play caller, Mike, whether he's been a head coach or a defensive coordinator, he's got like five or six bottom 10 defenses along along also with top 10 defenses. So the point is you need talent. These guys aren't miracle workers, Um, but they certainly, if you look at sort of the discombobulation of last year, that should not be an issue. Everybody should be on the same page, at least defensively, offensively. We'll have to see. I'm a little concerned about it, but we'll have to see. Uh, All right, Jeff Mosher, guys, check out the Inside the Birds podcast with uh, reasons for concern, reasons for optimism. You can get that wherever you listen to your podcast. And don't forget their YouTube channel. Just search Inside the Birds, and you can hear football at four each day on the Inside the Birds YouTube channel. Mosher's back on Wednesday. Adam will be here tomorrow, and our division previews continue with Andrew on Thursday. We'll be looking at the AFC South this week. Uh, which is a headline by the Houston Texans, we think, anyway. They were supposed to be last place last year. They end up winning the damn division. All right, Mosh. Nobody we'll talk- knows anything, Mike. Nobody <laughs> knows anything. Mosh, take care, bud. See ya. There's Jeff Mosher from uh, the Inside the Birds podcast. You can uh, subscribe and get that wherever you listen to your podcast. I'm Mike Gill. This is the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. We've got uh, a lot to do still, including Kevin Pelton. From ESPN.com, how can these Sixers nail their offseason? That's tonight at 5 o'clock, and you can watch him on the X platform at 973 ESPN. Use the hashtag SB Live. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Dallas Goddard, what he said about Kellen Moore. Also, what Jalen Hurts and his relationship with Kellen Moore over the weekend. We'll dive into that a little bit more later on in the show when we come back. I gave Nick Earnshaw a homework assignment, and you know what? He completed it. He completed the homework assignment. That's coming up during today's edition of Nick's Nuggets here on the Sports Bash. That's next on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. And, of course, streaming live video on the X platform at 973 ESPN. This hour is brought to you by Broadleys Plumbing, Heating, Air Conditioning, your trusted source for heating and plumbing service and installation for generations, 609-390-3907. Visit them online at broadleys.net. Before we get to Nick, let me take one more look to see if this Phillies, I have not seen their lineup out yet today. I do not see it. Still not out. 422 in the Phillies lineup is not out. All right, more Sports Bash coming up. Nick's Nuggets are on the other side. Don't go away. You're listening. At Zaxby's, we don't just make chicken fingers. We make the most premium tenderloin. 12-hour marinated, hand-breaded, fried to golden perfection. Deserves not one, not two, not even three, but your choice of 12 dipping sauces chicken fingers. Chicken fingers that you can dip, dunk, or drizzle in ranch. And Zach sauce. And spicy Zach sauce. And honey mustard. And tongue torch. And barbecue. And I'm out of time. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. With Mike Gill. When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. I can't see him, but he talks to me. On 97.3 ESPN. 4.30 on the Sports Bass Live, 97.3 ESPN. Phillies lineup just released just a minute ago. It's brought to you by Clark's Moving and Storage in Rio Grande. Moving to Breeze with Clark's Moving and Storage. We'll get the lineup to you in just a second here. Nick Earnshaw, Nick's Nuggets are coming up. 
And he is brought to you by Bet365. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary. At Bet365, Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Bohm, Castellanos, Stott, Marsh, Dahl, Stubbs. You got a lot of lefties there, man. Holy mackerel. What, five lefties in a row to end that lineup, actually wrap it around to the front with Schwarber in the leadoff spot. You got lefties with Stott, Marsh, Dahl, Stubbs, and then back to Schwarber. So five straight lefties plus Harper in the lineup. Six lefties in the lineup against Casey Mize tonight. He is the starter uh, for the Detroit Tigers at Comerica Park. Nick Earnshaw is here for another edition of Nick's Nuggets. What's up, Nick? What's going on, Mike? You know, all right, Hamilton. We got the lineup. How about that? Yeah, what was the, what was the delay there? <laughs> I don't know if you got the reference. I, wa- I did my homework over the weekend. Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I did it. I watched it. It was good. I'll give it like a 7.1 out of 10. So those of you who didn't listen on Friday's show, I told Nick <laughs> Earnshaw his homework assignment was to watch Fast Times at Ridgemont High based on the song that we played entering the Knicks Nuggets segment. And I said, what song is uh, movie is this song from? He didn't know. I said, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. He said, I never saw it. I said, now you need to watch it. So you watched it last night. I did. I watched it last night. I put it up on X, uh, where you can watch us now, SB Live. Use that hashtag. Um, but, yeah, I watched it. It was good. 7.1 out of 10 is what I will give it. Uh, it was pretty funny. I can't lie. It yeah, was, it was I mean, it's movie. it's like a classic Dude. 80s movie, yeah. Sean Penn, just a stoner. You know, it's not like a 10, <laughs> but, I mean, it's definitely I – mean, it's a nice uh, – uh, little uh, Phoebe Cates has a nice scene in that in the movie. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's a good yeah, movie. Yeah, Spicoli, man. I, I, what a character he was. I, I, I enjoyed it. It was a good one. I Listen, I, Josh and I at the party over the weekend, we're talking about all the things I have not watched. I can check this one finally off of the list, and, and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, well, would you recommend it to somebody else? I would. I would definitely recommend it to someone my age. You may have not seen it yet. It's a pretty good film. It's a good film. It's a good yeah, film. the, the only it. thing, like, it's like <laughs> it's a timeless type of movie, yeah. but no cell phones. You always think about a movie with no cell phones in it and how things would be different, you know? Very weird. Very weird that nobody was on a cell phone in that movie. You had to call people. Yeah, it's, it was just a different time. Different time that I'm not used to. I'm not used to. I'm a big Seinfeld guy, so I, I, I understand the kind of the time period, 80s, 90s. No cell phones, so I get it, but it was a good movie. I enjoyed it. I did my homework. I was not going to – I just needed an extension. That's it. I needed the extension through the weekend. I was very busy, so I, got, I finally Sunday night crammed it in last second, got to watch it. It was fantastic. Mike, I appreciate the recommendation. Good, good, good. Well, I'm glad you watched it. I'm <laughs> glad you did your homework, and uh, I'm looking forward to what the Nuggets are today. Yeah, man. All right, we'll move to nugget number one today. And I got to start with the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, Obviously, you just announced the lineup, but they're in Detroit this week. But we have a a new starter into the uh, the, rotation now. So Spencer Turnbull is now back into the rotation because Taiwan Walker is heading to the IL, Mike. You know me. I'm a big Turnbull guy. Love seeing Turbo out there pitch. Loved him as a starter early on in the year. I wanted him to stay in the rotation until he really fell apart and they had to bring Walker back. That did not happen for obvious financial reasons. So Turnbull's back to start on uh, on Wednesday against his former team, who he spent a decade in the organization with a long time. So pretty, pretty big deal that he's going to be going back on Wednesday to start in Detroit against his former team. Uh, but I just want to talk about Taiwan Walker a little bit here, Mike. He he struggled on Friday night, and it was very evident. I was in the stands for that ball game. His velocity was way low. I mean, he was at 88, 89, 90. Uh, was it great? Uh, and then, you know, we know the whole thing about Walker is his splitter, right? Like, that's his main go-to pitch. I have a little stat for you. Opponents this year against Taiwan Walker's splitter are batting 426 with a 7-0 for slugging percentage against it, Mike. So I don't know. Walker, he's going to head to the IL for a little bit. Now, if Turnbull comes back, Mike, and starts pitching well, you can't take him out of the rotation this time. I'm very intrigued to see what happens if that's the case. If Turnbull starts, you know, kind of rocking and rolling, and then you have to make that decision a second time. I get it the first time, right? It was like, hey, listen, we're paying this guy, blah, blah, blah. We got to do all. But, and you wanted to limit Turnbull's innings. 
See, I figured this would happen probably after the All Star break, and then Turnbull gets the 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 August September starts, and you have like a injury come up uh, in quotes for Taiwan Walker, which quite frankly might be what this kind of is here. An injury in quotes, quite frankly, you know, hey, right. he has a blister on his finger. All right, yeah, great. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with him though. They're paying this guy big money and for two more years. I mean, to completely, yeah. you know, just throw him out of the rotation, that's a tough one to swallow, man. It, it, this is one mistake that Dave Dombrowski has made. He's not perfect, but this is one bad one uh, that he is responsible for. What to do with Taiwan Walker? Yeah, I, I mean, at this point, I mean, he doesn't have a ton of trade value, especially with the contract that he's under. So you can't really move him. You're not going to send him down. You can just put him in the bullpen. Stick him there, I guess, right? Uh, I, mean, I mean, he's never pitched out of the bullpen. His stuff just doesn't project to that. I mean, to me, you almost might have to eat the money or, or just maybe trade him. Look, there's a lot of teams out there that could use a Taiwan Walker for the same reason the Phillies use him. He pitches every fifth day, and he eats up a bunch of innings. Now, the money is the problem, but the Phillies might just have to eat the money just to get him out of here because you don't want to have a miserable guy, and I'm not saying that he is yet, but he was not happy about last year not pitching in the playoffs. We know he's not going to pitch in the playoffs again this year. And, you know, what happens, let's just say this scenario happens. He's on the 15-day IL. He comes back. And let's say he pitches really well the rest of the way. Like last year in June, he was outstanding. He was probably their best pitcher in June last season, right? Yeah. Well, even if he's great this year, there's still no room for him to pitch in the playoffs. He's the fifth guy here. I mean, Christopher Sanchez might not get more than two playoff starts here. So even if he's great, what are you going to do with him? He's never pitched out of the bullpen. I don't think he has one bullpen appearance in his career. So if you trade him, you will have to eat the salary. You're going to have to pay someone else to take him. That would be the only thing I could see happening here. And you got to try to find a team that just needs an innings eater, right? A, a team that's maybe in contention, and you say to them, hey, we'll pay the salary for him to go there. Give us back something in return. Yeah, I, I, when it comes to Walker, it, it's just like he is making so much money, it's going to be hard to move him. You're going to have to eat a ton of that contract just to put, just to get a, get rid of him at this point. And I, I don't know if it'll be there. And, but you have to also think about this. The, the Phillies don't have a lot of organizational depth after like that six starter, right? Like, yeah, they moved Turnbull. They brought up Mercado, Cardo, right? Uh, Mercado, excuse me. They bring him up. I, they, they don't have a ton of starting pitching depth after that. So you you keep them around in case something happens, right? Like if something were to happen to a, to a, a Wheeler, a Nola, or a Ranger, um, hopefully it doesn't. We don't. We're not saying that. But like you don't have a ton of depth at the starting position. You you might you might as well just keep them all on the roster at some point, and then maybe just leave them off the playoff roster if, if that's the route you want to go because they don't have a ton of starting pitching depth throughout the organization. Hey, well, th and that's funny you say that because uh, Frank was on earlier. We did the mailbag, and I asked him about that. You got Sanchez, Suarez, Payne, uh, uh, Nola, and Wheeler. That's four guys. Yep. I'm imagining, and, and this is the assumption they're going to lock up Suarez. What happens to Painter and Abel and McGarry? What, I mean, do you have to use one of those guys knowing that there's not really a lot of room for all these arms? Now, you want organizational depth, but you can't keep a number one pick sitting in the minors because you don't have a spot yeah. for him. At some point, that guy's going to be like, yo, I'm ready for the majors here. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And having Walker here for two more years on that deal is blocking one of those. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. So this isn't only going to be a problem this year. It's going to be a problem. You know, Painter should be back for next season. Right. I would imagine Andrew Painter is going to be on the big league roster. Well, you've already got four starters signed plus Walker. That's five. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is a problem that they're going to have going forward with Walker kind of blocking guys coming up. I, I just can't see him being here past this year uh, because he's not, not going to really be used. He's been used as an e innings eater. He hasn't been very good. He's also been hurt. And, you know, you're going to be blocking the younger guys. Now, you can move on from some of those younger guys in, in trades with the trade deadline coming up. Won't be shocked. Some of those guys get moved 
in the minor leagues at this point. It, it's just very interesting. But Turnbull will be back. Maybe you get the same out. Listen, he's at an ERA under two in six starts this year for the Phillies. So he's been really good um, when he has started. Uh, he's been okay up and down since he's been in the bullpen as a long relief type of guy. Uh, but he pitched very well on Friday night when he came in relief of Walker. So I'm very curious to see how how much they'll get out of uh, Turnbull. He's a fascinating guy. I mean, I don't know if you knew this, Mike. Uh, according to an article in The Athletic, you know he went to, to um, management and at, he fills a blue duffel bag. I don't know if you've seen him walking out there to the bullpen. He fills it with tennis shoes, two gloves, a weighted ball, sunglasses, a football, and a small jar of honey. He's an interesting <laughs> fella. I'll tell you that. So he's a fascinating character. Maybe he could be a nice bright spot for this team going down the stretch. That's, that's an article in The Athletic about Turnbull today. Yeah, I, he is a little goofy. He was a top <laughs> prospect too, man, and yeah. he's never worked out. Remember, he was 3-17 and 17 one year for the Tigers. So yeah. let's not uh, act like, you know, I know he's got off to a great start here. And maybe he's one of those late bloomers. This is a guy who's 30 years old. He's not mm -hmm. like a young kid who, you know, is one of your prospects that you're bringing up here. He's been a failed guy who is maybe now just finding his way. Yeah, li listen, he, he was in the organization with the Tigers for almost a decade. So he was there for a long time. Maybe you just need a change of scenery. Maybe it's in Philadelphia. Maybe he, he could be a bright spot. All right, moving along to nugget number two and the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, nice little report. Uh, about Jalen Hurts uh, coming out of camp, uh, according to Jeremy Fowler, ESPN on Sports Center, he said, "Quote: I'm told Hurts has done a good job this off season of being vocal and taking ownership of the plays he likes and the plays he doesn't. Working with Kellen Moore, so that's something fans, Eagles fans, have been talking about with Jalen Hurts as part of the conversation surrounding the the franchise quarterback." That he hasn't been vocal enough. He needs to be out there and take more leadership in a vo vocal way. And this is kind of what he's been doing this offseason, working with Kellen Moore and trying to understand this new offense. Remember, it's another new offense he has to learn. He's like at uh, I don't think he's had one year of of uh, of having the same coordinator since high school. So it's been a it's he had a, one. A he had the turnover. one year with Steichen yeah. back to back. Two, two years in a row. Yep. So, I mean, this, this so for him, he's taking ownership. Star he's being shit. more vocal than he has in the past. People have gotten on him for it. Um, th th this is a big deal, Mike, to have him be vocal. And he's got to be involved in everything. Uh, but it, it's a good thing that Hurts is speaking up about plays because the offense was so bland last year. Yeah, no, there's been a lot this weekend. Jeremy Fowler mentioned, um, I, I did hear that, that, you know, he's kind of taking ownership. He's uh, vocal with Kellen Moore, that him and Kellen Moore have been kind of on the same page um, a lot. And that Nick Sirianni's put in a large amount of trust in Kellen Moore to handle a lot of things with this offense. So people are yeah. talking about, like, hey, this uh, this whole thing between Sirianni and Hurts. Um, I think Sirianni is saying, hey, Jalen, it's time for you to graduate for me to somebody else. You know, my voice is this. Go there and, you know, work that whole thing out. You two guys get on the same page. So uh, I feel like it's an encouraging thing that they got the new voice in there and that Sirianni is letting him kind of handle the things, like that he's not yeah. being a, a meddler here. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, it's being reported that he's embracing these changes from Kellen Moore because they're going to kind of keep some of the Sirianni stuff in there with Kellen Moore adding more uh, more, more creativity to the offense this year. And he's embraced it. He is uh, taking advantage and figuring out what he likes, what he doesn't like. They're just going to have to be more creative on offense. It was too bland. It was easy offense for defenses to figure out this year. You want your quarterback's input, what's going to work for him and what is not. I'm excited. I, I think this is a good sign for Jalen Hurts and the Eagles heading into the season. They got tons of weapons. You got to be creative with all these guys. Well, listen, they have a ton of talent. That we know. We know yeah. they have a ton of talent. The question is, what happened last year? Why did the talent that they have not translate to more success? They had 10 wins, 11 wins, I think. What they ended with, 11 wins last year? 11, yeah. Um, they won 11 games in the NFL. That ain't easy to do. It's just how they got them, and where they got them. They were all the first 12 weeks of the season or so, and that the way they finished the year, that's what stands out about last year. Yep, the, the ultimate collapse last year. Ah, we lost Nick there. It looks like he froze up on us here. But, uh, yeah, the ultimate collapse last season is definitely the case. Uh, you had a team that got off to a 10-1 and one start. You had a team that basically, um, you know, fell apart. There he is. Nick is back. Yes, the ultimate collapse last year.
<laughs> yes, for sure. All right, let's move on to nugget number three. Uh, we we had a question of the day today regarding the Philadelphia Flyers, um, and that was, does the Flyers adding top prospect Matvey Mitchkov make you more excited about this upcoming season? Mike, how could you not get more excited about Mitchkov coming over? I mean, this is a guy... I, who's Alex Ovechkin? Uh, he was a seventh overall pick for the Flyers just about a year ago. How I mean, he's a big comp to Evgeny Malkin. He's a center. He's a forward. He's going to be. He's considered to be one of the best players coming out of that draft. And the whole thing was because he dropped was because he was over in Russia. And they didn't know when he would be coming over. So he's coming over. He's going to be a flyer. He's young. Everyone thinks he's going to be a star. Of course, you're going to get excited. And you know why, Mike? After everything that happened with Cutter Gartier uh, during this season, getting traded, didn't want to be here, et cetera, you already lost one of your talented prospects. To have Mitch Kov now come over, this is a big deal. I would be thrilled the Flyers are bringing him back. And the Flyers had a good season last year. They collapsed, too, towards the end of the year, missed the playoffs. But to add him to the mix, a center position that they have struggled with lately in recent years, I, I you can't not get excited. Hey, listen, um, I'm not the biggest hockey guy in the world. I'm not anti-hockey. I just don't have time for it in my life. But that being said, <laughs> I'm intrigued to see what he yeah. brings to the table. When you have a player, you know, I said the Flyers were a solid team this year. They weren't great. They weren't a playoff team, but they weren't god-awful. But there wasn't a player that you're like, man, I, I watch because this guy, they don't haven't had that guy for a long yeah. time. I mean, even uh, Claude Giroux at his best – wasn't like a must-see kind of guy. He was very right. fundamentally sound, and he was a great player, but he wasn't must-see. He wasn't like a, a, you know, a, a great goal scorer. He was more of an assist guy. You're hoping that you have a guy that makes you say, I got to watch them tonight. I got to see what this guy is going to do. And it's exciting to hear that you're getting him two years earlier than you thought. Yeah. 19 years of age like this is and he's a playmaker he can score goals like this is an exciting player that the flyers and flyers fans have been waiting for for a long long time i, I mean there's no reason not to get excited you can't just because of his age of course he's going to take time to develop but he should get get in right away and make an impact and once you have a star player like that that's when you're going to be able to draw in free agents oh i want to play with that guy right like this could start the rebuild process and enhance it and accelerate it over these next couple of years with having him come over earlier than expected you could be more in contention um quicker than you thought i mean this is this is the type of guy and type of player that people think and scouts think that he's going to be so when you're able to bring a guy over like that you, there's no reason not to get excited. Like, he's the player you want to go get your jer- go spend money and get a jersey on. There you go. So you're getting a sweater? I probably will. I haven't gotten a Flyers uh, jersey or a jersey in a long time for, for that reason because they haven't been very good. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, getting the Flyers sweater is a big move there. That is, is. That's taking a big step in life. I've been to one Flyers game in probably three years. Really? That, that, yeah, I've to attend it. I mean, I've been in the nosebleeds one time. I mean, they haven't given me a reason to go sit up in the nosebleeds, Mike. And, you know, Billy was giving me crap about not sitting in the nosebleeds on Friday. And, of course, they lost. So for the Phillies. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, um, I didn't go to a Flyers game this year. I didn't either. I went last year, I think, to one. I'm trying to remember. But hey, listen, I'm I'm uh, I'm intrigued. I'm definitely intrigued to see what's gonna happen next. Yeah. Uh, well we'll see what happens with the Flyers. I, I think I don't know when I'll go to another game, but if Mitch coughs there, I'm gonna buy tickets. I'll sit up in the nose bleeds. Well, I'll you go, go watch Mitch So Cough. this I'll year. Yeah, I'll go next year, and I'll be in the nosebleeds like normal. (laughs) All right, man. (laughs) That's what I got for you. Nugget number three for you today, Mike. Three pack of nuggets today. All right, well, good job on your homework assignment. You're welcome. It was a good homework assignment. I think I got an A. I got an A. Spicoli, all right, Hamilton. I'm getting the references down. Catching up. That's right. There you go. All right. uh, What was the teacher's name? Do you remember? Uh, Mr. Hand, right? Mr. Hand. There you yeah, go. Yeah, Mr. Hand. I, I, I watched it. I didn't fake it. I didn't fake it out. I, I did my homework. I, I completed the assignment. Ah, good stuff. All right. Uh, <laughs> Nick Earnshaw, Nick's Nuggets, everybody here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. And streaming live on the X platform at 973 ESPN. They are brought to you 
by Bet365, whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. Phillies lineup, we told you that. And if you're watching the live stream, you can see it scrolling at the bottom. Your pitching probables tonight, it's Aaron Nola, 8-3, and three, against Casey Mize, who is 1-5 and five with a 443 ERA. Um, very left-handed lineup for the Phillies. Six left-handers in the lineup to face Casey Mize tonight for the Detroit Tigers. Coming up next hour, we will talk to ESPN.com NBA writer Kevin Pelton. He's going to join us. How he thinks the Sixers can nail the offseason. Kevin used to work in the Indiana Pacers front office. He'll tell us what he thinks the Sixers can do to try to get that pulled off. There's a lot of stuff surrounding the Sixers. What's going on with Paul George? Jimmy Butler's name is starting to pop back in. What's happening there? Find out when Kevin Pelton joins us. Coming up next on the Sports Pass Live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app, and streaming live video on the X platform at 973 ESPN. Use the hashtag SB Live, and you'll see Kevin Pelton with me next on the Sports Bash. This is the Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Now live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. Five o'clock, Sports Bash Live, 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. I'm Mike Gill. So the Phillies tonight, they're in Detroit. They've got the Tigers. We've got uh, plenty of football that we discussed earlier today. Football at four. Check that out if you're watching the video at 973 ESPN. You can always go back and watch the show. Use the hashtag SB Live. Uh, coming up, Kevin Pelton, ESPN.com NBA writer. Uh, how the Sixers can nail the offseason. You know, so between now and next Sunday when free agency opens, okay, you will hear and see a plethora of stories, right? And all of them will connect to Philadelphia. Kevin Pelton is here. He's going to talk a little bit more about the plan for the 76ers. I mean, everybody likes the Sixers situation here because they've got all the money, Kevin Pelton. They have the cap space. They're a good team. So it seems that Every free agent is going to be connected to Philadelphia in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so how much of the stuff that we're hearing right now with Philadelphia, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, Brandon Ingram, and just about anybody else should we take seriously? Well, they can't all be true at the same time, I suppose. Right. Uh, I'm, I mean, the interesting thing about this, I think, from Philly's perspective is that you have like so many different options to sort through. It's almost more of a challenge than a team that, you know, if you had precisely just the the $40 million salary spot or whatever, and you're like, okay, we can fit one guy into this spot. In, in Philly's case, there's just a lot of moving parts because it's not only potentially one of these high salary players it's how do we bring back some of our own guys to fill in those other spots around him because this is the closest we've had really potentially to a blank slate going into cap space in a long period of time it it was pretty common you know back in the day I, i remember what the Lakers had, I think, like Lamar- LaMarcus Aldridge and I forget who even the other Max player was, but it was like it was going to be Kobe and those two guys and everyone else on minimums because that's how they were going to have to make it work cap wise back then. And that used to be fairly common because we saw so many stars hit free agency. What makes Philly unique is we have not seen a good team with max level cap space since really, I think, 2019. So you have Embiid and you have Maxi. we think. Uh, Maxi will sign eventually. What is the best case scenario to get this thing going if you're Daryl Morey? What do you think Daryl Morey's hoping for when Sunday comes around? I mean, I think Daryl's MO has always been star players because they tend to historically be underpaid relative to their contribution. And then I think the other thing that, you know, you can believe if you're Maury in the Sixers front office is 
we are uniquely capable of going out and finding role players to put around stars. We signed Kelly Oubre Jr. for the minimum last year and watched him have this terrific starting season. So if we get those guys in place, we're going to figure out the rest of the roster, even if maybe it takes a year or two to quite get the kind of depth you'd need to to really contend at the, the highest level. And that's tough at Joel Embiid's age and, you know, Paul George's age in, in this scenario. But I, I think he has to be the, the plan A because other than LeBron James, who we don't, we has not been linked to Philly. He's the best guy who might change teams. So it, you would be an advocate if you're Daryl Morey of signing Paul George as a free agent. What if he opts back in, gets the forty-eight million, and then the trade scenario? Are you as interested if you have to trade a draft pick to get him? Less interested, and I don't think it makes sense. If you're Paul George, the opt-in scenario, the reason it works is because all of a sudden I don't have to consider just teams that have cap space. I can consider, you know, a trade to the, the Knicks, let's say. It's, that's one scenario that they mooted on the low post last week, who could never sign you outright for anything close to your max, but could put together a trade yeah. for you. I, I just don't think Philly that would happen because it, there wouldn't be that much benefit to Paul George of doing it, and it certainly wouldn't be a benefit to the Sixers of giving up a draft pick for him. Uh, Kevin Pelton, ESPN.com, looking at all the Sixers scenarios, which there are a ton. A lot of this is because they got the Tobias Harris deal finally off of their books, which has given them the chance to go into another direction. So Paul George is a free agent. He would be at the top of the list. But what about the Jimmy Butler, Brandon Ingram, that type of guy who wants more money, their team's not interested, and now they become trade candidates? Is that something that is maybe more desirable to Philadelphia? I don't think more desirable because the beauty of going out and signing a player in free agency is you get to keep those draft picks and save them for whatever else is in store, and you still have the player. Butler is an interesting one. You know, I... I understand the appeal to the Sixers. Obviously, it's the the path not taken back when they did re-sign Tobias Harris instead of him. You're not necessarily getting the Jimmy Butler of the past, you know, four seasons or five seasons or however long it's been in in Miami thus far. You're five. getting Jimmy Butler. Five over miserable the years with Tobias Harris here. <laughs> You're getting the Jimmy Butler of, you know, the next couple of seasons that he's under contract, plus the extension that you're going to have to give him if you're acquiring him in a deal like this. And that player, you know, is he going to fit as well at this stage of his career with Embiid, given the non-shooting and Tyrese Maxey? And is it going to be worth giving up all the draft picks? I'm a little more skittish about that scenario unless you start to strike out on a lot of things in free agency. Ingram, to me, is interesting. He also carries, I think, some fit issues because he's somebody who, you know, much like, I guess, a a younger Tobias Harris, really likes to play with the ball in his hands a lot in a way that you wouldn't if you're playing with Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. But he can shoot the three. He, you know, could be a a scorer on the second unit when he's playing alongside just one of those guys as opposed to two other ones in the starting lineup. And although you're still looking at, I think, a similar size extension potentially, this season his cap hit is so much lower than Jimmy Butler and Paul George that if it's Brandon Ingram that you're taking into cap space, it, it gives you a lot more spending power. But the flip side of those trades is, look, New Orleans and Miami aren't making these trades just to create giant trade exceptions or to create cap space. They're going to want players in return. And that's where it's an interesting scenario because you, there almost has to be a third or maybe even a fourth team involved has no players available to give you. Right. Philadelphia's roster is barren. They don't have players to include in a trade. I guess Paul Reed might be a possibility at $7 right. million dollars there. Kevin I Pelton, ESPN. The Pelicans. Yeah, and like you know, the the whole you know the the Miami thing is interesting because you know generally you know they I guess you could have a three team deal with with Butler going to Philly, Ingram going to Miami, and then the draft picks going with Philadelphia, giving the draft picks to New Orleans. Like would those three teams acquiesce in that matter? I I think it it makes some sense. I. I still think, though, you need a fourth team yeah. because, again, New Orleans wants, you know, whether it's a center to to replace Jonas Valanciunas, who's hitting free agency or, you know, some kind of a, a long term upgrade on the wing. They're not going to be doing this again just for cap space because they wouldn't really create much of it. So the Sixers have the cap space. 
it's not a great free agent class. So what happens if you strike out on Paul George? You can't consummate a trade. What what happens next? Well, where where are you if you're Daryl Morning in that situation? With hey, I got a bag of money, and I got nobody at this point. Like if George ends up opting in, getting traded, and you can't work out a deal, is that still a desirable spot for them? So I don't know if any of your listeners are also listeners to the Dunked On NBA podcast. We annually do this mock off season where each of us, three of us take over 10 different teams. And then Nate is the host, serves as the player agent. And I had the Sixers this year. So I was in that position. (laughs) Uh, Went after Paul George, didn't get him. Went after OG Ananobi, didn't get him. He stayed with the Knicks. And my plan C in that scenario was to go heavily after Malik Monk. Now, based on the fact that Monk already re-signed with the Kings, has agreed to re-sign for the largest deal they could offer him, four years, $78 million, a lot less than I offered him, for the record, <laughs> in that mock-off season, uh, is, is the result of a bidding war. It se- seems maybe that wasn't the Sixers' direction. I mean, the other scenario that was a little tougher to do there is, I think then you start to look, I think, a lot more at the trade market and breaking this up into several more manageable salaries. Because, you know, the, as much as Sixers fans, I think, are dreaming of the fact that Oh, we've had Tobias Harris making all this much mo- all this money, and now he comes off the cap. The flip side of it is you had Kelly Oubre making the minimum. You had DeAnthony Melton making eight million. You know, pending his health, he probably gets more than that in free agency. If you know, if he he's recovered reasonably from this back injury that sidelined him most of last season, obviously Tyrese Maxey's salary is eventually going up as part of this deal you complete last. So I do think it does produce a little bit less spending power than you'd think, and it's maybe not you know, four or five guys coming in to, to fill in around and beat Maxi. you know, maybe it's three guys splitting up that cap space uh, and, and kind of trying to look at, you know, Derek Jones Jr. I think is someone else who would make some sense after the way he played in Dallas. If you could outbid what the Mavericks are able to offer him using the non-taxpayer mid-level exception, uh, Caleb Martin from Miami would be another guy in kind of that range who, who makes some sense as a fit. But it might not be a you know enough spending power to go out and get, like I said, four or five of those guys. Yeah, well, if that ends up being the case, and the guys you just mentioned, while nice players, it, it, would that be a, a an awful scenario for Daryl Morey to have this money? Because part of the frustration for a lot of Sixers fans has been, hey, Daryl Morey, what has he really done? And to, which I would say, well, he got handed kind of a pretty lousy deck that he untangled with the Al Horford deal, the Richardson deal. He has got himself cap space and picks, but if he can't do anything with it, like at what point do you start holding his feet to the fire and say, hey, we've given you four years, now's your opportunity. If this isn't a successful offseason, how does that look for him? I think the answer to this question is it doesn't matter what any of us think. (laughs) Uh, Even even the Philly sports fan community, it matters what Joel Embiid thinks. Because if Joel Embiid starts to question his ability to win in Philadelphia, that's when you have the problem. Like Embiid is... The, the target audience for all of these moves. So I, I think the scenario that, you know, if they aren't able to make a big at addition in free agency, the scenario that you start to go back and wonder about is, should they have tried to trade Tobias Harris with those draft picks as an expiring contract for players who were under contract last last off season and then or at the trade deadline? And then you could have approached this season this summer over the cap rather than creating cap space and just tried to use bird rights to re-sign a lot of those guys. It's possible that scenario could have ended up with more spending power for the Sixers than what they'll get out of this cap space. Uh, how valuable is Wednesday night for Philly? If you have the well, 16, is this a night where they can and should be active? It's interesting. I I think so. One scenario here is if you're trying to create more cap space, maybe you move down a few times, kind of piecemeal, and try to get second round picks out of this because not only you know do become very useful to you in terms of managing the luxury tax because they're making less than the the, uh, the, the, uh, the the guy I would be looking at for the Sixers I haven't had a chance to talk about this but I've been thinking about it for a while is Zach Eady from Purdue because I, even though he doesn't fill a lot of those like you've got that empty roster and you're just staring at it like it's better than any other 
it's on a team where they've constantly struggled to, you know, find ways to be successful with Joel Embiid on the bench. Uh, they have dealt with Joel Embiid's, you know, availability being an issue at times. Like, who better to fill that than Zach Eady is someone who you can kind of build that entire non-Embiid offense around him. And the nice thing about it is, you know, I think that's going to be difficult for some teams to do because you have to kind of play one style of play with your starters and then this totally different style of play when you start dumping the ball to Edie in the post against second units. Well, Philadelphia, who's already doing that, you know, Joel Embiid's more versatile. It's, you know, a lot of face-ups, the elbow, pick and rolls, that sort of thing. But they're built to space around a center in the post in a way that almost no other team is going to be. So I think Zach Eady is, if I'm Philadelphia, yeah. at the top of my board by far. Yeah, he also has a connection with Nick nurse uh i i you know uh, coached the canadian team so he worked with yep. Edie before that was where i was going to go next is kevin over the years the sixers like if a plan b could be hey we don't get paul george maybe we get like the group of like nick claxton and contavious caldwell pope and like because i say claxton just because the backup center has just been such a problem for this team and we saw what happened like hartenstein killed them last year getting an active guy you know, that can take some center minutes away. Could that be like a plan C is like, hey, let's dump the money into a player like Clax, or is he going to be too price himself out of that like plan B or C type of situation? Yeah, I think so, because you're – Looking at, at that point, the alternative, the, the scuttle with Claxton has been something like four years, 90 million, which yeah. is what he ended up going for in our mock off season. So at that price point, you're choosing between Claxton and a starter at one of those other spots in all likelihood. What I like about Edie in particular is, you know, anyone else you draft at 16 is not going to come in and start for you right away in all likelihood. I mean, maybe you hit a home run and get this year's equivalent of Jaime Jaquez Jr. in Miami or Brandon Pajemski in Golden State. But most likely it's someone you're looking at contributing two or three years down the road. And Edie can do it right away. And, uh, you know, obviously we know that, that Daryl's draft model is a big part of their, their draft process. And Edie blows away all the analytics models with his produ- productivity at Purdue. Um, lastly, Kevin, they have a ton of their own free agents, as we know, which is why they have a blank slate. Do you prioritize any of them or do you already realize, hey, we took a shot with this team. We got knocked out in the first round. It's time to just start over again and try to replace or do, or are there guys on this team that played last year that you would prioritize? Yeah, I wouldn't view it as start over, especially because this team was playing really well before Joel Embiid went out of the lineup. And, you know, Nico Batum was a big part of that. De'Anthony Melton was a big part of that. When he was healthy, his injury, I think, was, uh, along with Embiid's absence, Akito, you know, why they struggled so much in the second half and, and fell into the play-in. Uh, yeah, fell into the play-in. Mm-hmm. So Melton, and Melton, Batum, and Oubre would be the three guys that I would be prioritizing to try to bring back. And then Kyle Lowry is an interesting one, depending on what his price point is. Uh, if you can get him back using, you know, the the non-bird rights to pay 120% of what he was making last year, that might be a good use of cap space as well. Um, Buddy Heald, no, not, not bringing him back then. Lower on the list, I think that's just a situation where, you know, I mentioned I, I went after Malik Monk. It's a position where you can probably get a little bit younger or a little bit better defensively. And I think that's a spot where even with Monk not on the market anymore, there's better free agents, I think, available at shooting guard. You know, you mentioned Caldwell Pope is is a realistic option. Then I think there are Clay Thompson, I suppose. It doesn't sound like at this point he's going back to Golden State. He'd be a little older maybe than you'd prefer, but probably a better defender than than Buddy Heald and, and certainly more accomplished. I think there's more alternatives there than there are at the, the forward spots. What would you project Oubre is going to get? He's an interesting guy, don't you think? He is fascinating. I never would have expected that it, the market was so cool that he would end up signing for the minimum a year ago after averaging 20 points per game in Charlotte. I think he really proved something this year that he can contribute to a winning team. His on-ball defense against Jalen Brunson in the playoffs was really impressive. You know, does that get him up to, to 10 million a year, to, to 12 million, 15? I think somewhere in that range probably, but that's a pretty big jump from the minimum. Yeah, he'll be an interesting one. I, I'm, I'm very intrigued. And then Kyle Lowry's another one. There's a lot of rumors that, you know, buzz that he might come back. But that's not a, you know, obviously probably wouldn't make a whole heck of a lot of money. But the Ubre one, I'll be interested to see if the Sixers can figure out a way to get him back. Um, what do you think Tobias Harris gets on the market? 
That's a that's a fascinating one because I think a lot of people speculated for a long time about Detroit, uh, the homecoming element there, and a team that had a lot of cap space. Now they've got new management. Trajan Langdon just took over as the team president. Came in talking about we want to try to use our cap space to to make trades and acquire bad salaries from other team and get draft picks. The the hinky model, I suppose you can still say, uh, rather than going out and spending in free agency. So I, I still think he's accomplished enough that he probably ends up somewhere in that 15 million to 20 million range. But it's going to be interesting to see who that team is, where that where that money actually comes from. Crazy. That one will be interesting. I'm sure Sixers fans uh, will be uh, pleased as punch when he finally signs someplace else. Although I guess there's a possibility in the George scenario that the Sixers could use him in a sign and trade uh, situation that would, I guess, be if you're trying to get Paul George in a trade, you can use maybe Harris in a draft pick and swap those two out, right? Yeah, I think it would make more sense in the Brandon Ingram scenario we discussed. If New Orleans was interested in Harris as a replacement for Ingram, yeah. then maybe it's a fit because. Uh, for the Clippers, the challenge of that would be if you take a player in in a sign and trade, you hard cap yourself at the lower first apron, and that would really hamstring their ability to re-sign James Harden. James Harden, right? All right, Kevin Pelton. Uh, plenty more. You like this draft, or is it? Eh? I like some guys in this draft. They, they're not necessarily the guys everybody else lo- likes, but uh, you know, I mentioned Edi that I'm I'm relatively pretty high on, and then and Reed Shepard and Donovan Kling and all do quite well in my. Pre- well, draft Wednesday night. You can hear that right here. And Thursday, by the way, 4 o'clock uh, round two. Kevin Pelton, ESPN.com. Uh, check him out over there for all of the offseason coverage, the draft, free agency, and more. And he was kind enough to join us here on the Sports Bash on this Monday. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, great stuff. And check out his piece over at ESPN.com. Uh, the way that each NBA team can nail their offseason. He, along with Chris Herring, wrote that one. And, uh, yeah, the one thing with the Sixers is he mentioned about nailing the offseason, a lot of it is incumbent on other factors. I mean, if Paul George opts into his deal, well, then you're in uh, kind of up the creek without a paddle on that one because I don't think you're end up uh, going to end up taking Paul George in a trade scenario. You don't have any players on the roster to make a lot of these moves, as Kevin kind of chronicled. So thanks to Kevin Pelton. ESPN senior NBA writer here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. And don't forget, throughout this offseason, follow our insiders, Austin Krell, who's going to be in studio on Monday. Next week, in the 3 o'clock hour, we're going to do a full NBA preview, free agent preview with Austin Krell and our Sixers contributor, Michael Kasky-Blomain. Those two guys are covering the Sixers all all season long, and we are as well on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. I'm Mike Gill, and don't forget, Game 7 tonight, and you can only hear it on 97.3 ESPN. The coverage starts at 7.30. Edmonton and the Florida Panthers. History tonight. Florida will either win their first ever Stanley Cup or a Canadian team coming back from 3-0 to win a cup and a first Canadian team to win a Stanley Cup in 30 seasons. That's all on the line tonight on 97.3 ESPN. When it comes to Zaxby's fingers, there's a few non-negotiables. It's got to be only premium tenderloin, marinated for 12 hours and fried to crispy perfection. What is negotiable? The flavors you create mixing our 12 signature sauces. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Five twenty-eight Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Thanks to Kevin Pelton, ESPN.com NBA writer, who uh, gave us some great insight on NBA free agency for the Sixers, which starts Sunday. Teams can start signing free agents on Sunday. The draft is Wednesday night. You might see some trades. If you're listening on the radio, you'll hear some trades. I'm imagining the Sixers will be active on Wednesday night. We'll talk more uh, today, uh, excuse me, tomorrow and uh, Wednesday as we get ready for the draft. Wednesday night, you can listen to the draft on 97.3 ESPN. All right, it's time today for today's Big Three with Josh Henning, our producer. What do we got today? Mike, I want to start with kind of follow up on a conversation you were having with Kevin Pelton there about, hey, 
Max is going to sign his deal. We know they're going to sign him at some point. It's not if they're going to sign him, it's when. Well, I want to know from you, did you kind of you know, react a little bit when you saw another player signed his deal today? Raptors guard Scotty Barnes, five years, $270 million. And I got to say, it's not like Barnes is one of the best players in the league, but that's a lot of money to max out a guy. So you got to think we're looking at that kind of money for Maxi too. Well, we know Maxi's going to get a deal. The deal's been pretty much mapped out already. It's like two fifty or something like that. Right. Um, and there was a little wrinkle that's been being talked about is that his agent, um, who is also uh, LeBronzy, Rich Paul, Rich Paul. That they want the fifth year to be a player option so that he can be the guy who opts in or out. I don't think that's going to really change much here. But, nah. um, yeah, Barnes is, look, five-year 270. The problem with a guy like Scotty Barnes is a really good player. He averaged 20 points, eight rebounds, six assists. But he's not a guy who's going to take the team and be a championship. You know, like... Yeah. This isn't to knock Scotty Barnes. He's a very good player. But to pay $270 million for a player who's really, at best, like a third guy. Like, if Scotty Barnes is your third guy, you probably feel really good if he's your... Like, put it this way. They had Scotty Barnes and couldn't beat the Sixers last year. Right. So... I just, like, the league is a mess. And it's only going to get worse because these new television deals are going to kick in. You're going to see guys like, you know, I, I, I was hearing something about, um, where are you? Ah, man, uh, Derek White mm-hmm. making, like, could be making like $35 million a year. I mean, he's a great, like, role guy, but come on. But that's just the, the, the nature of where the salary cap's going to be taking right. these teams. So Scotty Barnes, five years, 270, very good player. But to say, like, if that's your franchise centerpiece, okay? Are you good enough to win a title because no. Scotty Barnes is your best player? No. no, and that's the problem. You you, are, you have to give these guys the contracts because you got to take care of your guys. I mean, he. I mean, when I saw this, I was, wow, he's the first Raptors player with 1,000 points, 75 steals, 75 blocks in a season since Chris Bosh. Like, that's how long it's been. But the Raptors didn't win with Chris Bosh. They won with a rental, basically, Kawhi Leonard, and a bunch of other guys around him. They didn't win with DeMar DeRozan, who's one of the highest scorers. Vince Carr, one of the highest scorers in franchise. So the franchise has already shown you, Mike, that you can have guys put up gaudy stats, but it, one guy doesn't win a championship. you got to have other guys, too. You do, and that one guy doesn't win a championship, but if, if you have one guy who's really good, mm-hmm. then the other guy's... LeBron James, Scotty Barnes is not. Right. <laughs> is he Kawhi Leonard? No. No. Is he Kevin Durant? No. no. Is he Steph Curry? No. No. But you're paying these guys now to be in that on that platform. Right, you're, because you're forced to. Because you're forced to. And that's the problem. Now, Toronto backs himself into mediocrity now for the next, until that contract's up. Right, for the next five years. For the next five years, there's Scotty Barnes and whoever we can get away with bringing in here and hope for the best. Yeah, it's a shame. The league's a mess. The the, the salary structure, and this is all leagues. It's not, but theirs is really bad. Scotty Barnes, great player, not an elite player. Mike, another NBA story earlier today. I want to get your thoughts. Kenny Atkinson getting another shot at head coaching with the Cleveland Cavaliers. He will be their new head coach. Remember the Cavs lost in the second round to the Celtics. Does Kenny Atkinson move your uh, meter at all? Good coach. I mean, somebody was talking about this the other day. I don't remember. I think it was Fortin Ball on Carlin versus Joe. And he was saying something that I've said for years. There's about five NBA coaches, and I don't even know that there's five, that move the needle one way or the other. That most of these coaches are just what they are. Right. Is Kenny Atkinson a good coach? I think so. Uh, I'll never forget, and I say this a lot, and I haven't said it in a while, but um, I asked somebody about when Mo Cheeks was the Sixers coach. Right. I said, what kind of coach is Mo Cheeks? He said, if you give Mo Cheeks 35-win talent, he'll give you 35 wins. 
If you give him 45-win talent, he'll get you 45 wins. If you give him 55-win talent, he'll get you 55 wins. <laughs> but that's essentially what the NBA coach is. You're only as good. Now, can the coach pull out a game or something here or there? Very infrequently. I think Kenny Atkinson, is he an upgrade over what they had? Sure. <laughs> I mean, he was a good coach with, with not – that was an average Brooklyn team he had, and he got them to be average. Right. Well, he maximized their talent, but because he wasn't the guy that Durant and Kyrie wanted, he was pushed out the door for Steve Nash, right? So part of the reason why, according to the article in front of me, the, the reports are that the reason why the Cavs wanted Atkinson is because they view him as a high-level player development guy, and they believe that he's going to be able to get more out of their players than Bickerstaff did. So... Is, and he is might that, be able to. And listen, they is have that valid. Uh, that team was good this year. They weren't great. Um, you'd say that Bickerstaff. They got forty-eight wins. They were the four seed. I think that's probably about what people thought of them. If not, maybe people thought they were less than that. Mm-hmm. And Bickerstaff got them forty. Now they got knocked out in the. Second, Second round, round right? by the Celtics. I don't know that this move does anything. To answer your – like, I mean, they got a nice roster. We'll see what ends up happening with Mitchell. Um, you know this it, isn't more than a second-round team. To me, what it feels like is you, you have a car. It works good for you, but maybe not 100% happy with it. So you go to the dealership and you trade it in, and you get a newer car – Maybe it's got better gas mileage, but there's really not much of a difference. That's what it feels like to me. Yeah, I, I just don't think, like, we'll see what ends up happening. Put it this way. I don't think them changing the coach is changing their, um, how far they can go. Now, if they change their roster a little bit, that might change my mind. We'll have to see. I mean, they do have some options they could make some changes with. Well, the big one is what's going to happen with Mitchell. There's been a lot of buzz about Mitchell. And then, of course, the other guy is Garland. Mm -hmm. Do they want to keep both of them? Or is one of them going to go? Mobley's a very good player for them. Uh, I like Allen a little bit. So they have a good team. They don't have a lot of depth on that team. No. They won 48 games. They got to the second round. I don't know what else they thought that that team was. Unrealistic expectations ends up firing the coach. It's the formula for the NBA for generations, and it's why like the same six teams have won titles because the formula is not the coach's fault. Right. It's you don't have good enough players. That's been the formula. Mike, I'm not sure I want to get your thoughts on. So despite climate protesters of the Travelers yesterday who stormed the 18th hole, Scotty Scheffler went on to win – in the playoff hole against Tom Kim. What's significant about this is Scotty Scheffler is now the first golfer since Tiger Woods to win six times in a season on the PGA Tour. And he's actually on track to have the one of the highest grossing money years of all time. He's already in the top seven most money made, and it's not part of this probably because of the escalating prize money, but he could be on par coming up, no pun intended, with Tiger Woods, his previous years where people thought, wow, Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer in the world. Sky Scheffler is on pace for that kind of year. Mike, your thoughts? Well, Scotty Scheffler is right now in a... Listen, nobody will ever be Tiger Woods again. I don't right. know. Like, some people are Jordan people. Some people like LeBron. The younger generation tends to go towards LeBron. The older heads go to Jordan. I don't think any generation is going to have a split on anybody in the current game being better than Tiger Woods. Sure. So, But he's still making history. Sure, but the game is just not as popular as it was. No one will get the ratings. No one will generate the buzz that Tiger Woods did. Scheffler, I, I didn't even know he won the tournament this weekend. That's how little that he's gener- a little buzz he generates. You didn't see the people storming the 18th green? I did hear about the protesters, but I didn't know who won the tournament. Gotcha. So, um, 
yeah, just Sheffler was a boring guy. He just kind of blah. There was a time, you know, where the golf field felt like there was like eight to 10, 12 different guys that were like kind of becoming, and they all just kind of faded. Right. They all feel like Rory Ma- really Macro has well, Rory's a been around for a while, though. I'm talking about like the group, like. Ah, man, there was a bunch of guys well, like that were... You mean like Jordan Spieth back in the day? Yeah, Jordan Spieth was one of them. He felt like he was ready to come. And then you had, um, you Ricky know... Ricky Fowler came Ricky along. Ricky Fowler was... Man, and then he just... And then the, the live thing took a lot of these guys. I mean, I can't tell you who's on what tour. The only thing I saw this weekend in golf was... I can't even remember who it was on the live tour who was screaming about the uh, the drone. <laughs> Wait, what? I didn't even see that. There was a drone shot, and he and he yells that this is like that every week he goes to take a shot, and the drone comes zipping by him when he's in his backswing, and like he was like all ticked off about the fact that every week with the effing drone, John Rom. There you go, John Rom. The drone came right in his backswing, and he was all you know that this happens every week that the drone messes up his shot. That's the only thing I saw. Yep. This weekend with the golf game. Yeah, John Rahm apparently complained again, according to uh, this article from uh, The Mirror, that he's none too pleased with these drones constantly trying to distract him. He says, every tournament, every week, I got to deal with these drones in the bleeping background. Yep, that was the only golf story that I saw from the weekend. (laughs) Well, I was watching Scotty Shuffler. That's what I was paying attention to. On Sunday. And I thought it was pretty cool that he made some history. So, But you're right. He is boring. He's not interesting. And Tiger was facing a much deeper class of golfers when he was dominating. You know, you knew who a lot of those golfers were back from, Well, like I would say there, is, there are a lot of guys. They just kind of – I think the live thing has really hurt the sport. It split them up. You don't know right. who's where. But there was, like, like, Justin Rose, Johnson. I mean, there was a ton of these Both guys. Both Johnsons, Dustin and Zach Johnson. Yeah, there was a ton of these guys that almost every week were in play to win – and now, like, I don't know who's on the Live Tour. I don't know who's on the PGA Tour. Right. It's just been completely, um, you know, de- de- you know. Out of sight, out of Well, mind. depleted. It depleted the, the talent pool, and it kind of messed it up. Now, the story that I thought was interesting, J.J. Reddick had his, pod- his uh, podcast, his uh, press, conference press conference today, today and he said he is done podcasting. That's a disappointment. He said, for the time being, I am excommunicated from the content space. There will be no podcast. That's very disappointing. Can't have an NBA head coach doing a podcast, can you? Why not? I, I think I think it would improve the fans' perspective I, on these yeah, guys. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, you, I don't know. I mean, I get it. You can't. You don't have time to do podcasting if you're focusing you on you not, though? Uh, it's a bad look, I think. You think do you not have? Why? Yeah, I, I think it's a ridiculous question. What do you mean, why? why? He's an NBA head coach. It would be a great content thing for us, but I think it would be taking away from you being the head coach of a basketball team. And what are you going to do? Start airing out dirty laundry? It's going to give you nothing. He's not going to sit there and say anything about his team. I mean, come on. Well, the whole point of his podcasting was he's educating people. So why couldn't he keep educating people? Because you're now taking time away from your job. But if he's breaking down the X's and O's, isn't he still doing his job? Mm, I mean, I don't think so. No, I, I, I don't You're think, thinking I'm reaching here. Yeah, I don't think you would gain anything from him doing a podcast. So you feel like I'm just trying to spin this to, you know... Get it on the I don't right. know what you're trying to do. Well, uh, I'm trying to say that I think J.J. Reddick <laughs> can still do his job. He can, he can break down Laker film on the podcast. He could be like, hey, we won the game because we ran this set. I mean, half of his podcast is him basically just breaking down tape basically yeah i don't think it would be a good look if you're the head coach of the basketball especially if you're not a good team or you're a mediocre team and you're spent, well, even better content again content fine doing your job different so you i think, would not want my head coach of my team doing a podcast so you think that, that him doing the podcast would take away from him doing the coaching job he's supposed to be doing yeah for a multitude of reasons okay if you're breaking down your own team's film to the public, you're now telling all the other teams what your team's doing wrong. What are you, Nick Sirianni? You're, you're afraid to tell us what's going on? Everybody knows what you're doing. 
I don't think it's a very smart thing to have your head basketball coach sitting down doing a podcast, breaking down the deficiencies of his own team. Those are the kind of things I think you're better probably served of keeping it in house. Well, I'm not saying That's you break just down my the deficiencies. Opinion. I'm saying you go out there and say, "Hey, this is a set that worked really well for us, and this is why we're doing well." Well, now same thing. Now you're breaking down a set that worked really well for you, and you're basically advertising to everybody. Hey, here's a set that we like to run. But doesn't everybody already know what you're running if they're smart? If they're smart, you're if, assuming that they're smart. You're assuming that they've all figured it out. I'm Maybe assuming all the other coaches sit and that's watch a tape. bad. That's a bad assumption, though. I'm so, not, um, so you're saying that other coaches don't watch enough film. I don't know that they do or not, but I'm not going to go out of my way to help them out. Why would I help give them uh, give them something? Maybe they aren't good enough to do it. Or uh, why would I? I now, now we're assuming everybody's just stupid. <laughs> hey, and if they're not stupid, good for them. But why would I tell another team, this is one of our favorite sets. We love to run it. So let me break it down for you. So if I'm the coach of the team, you say, oh, here's one of J.J. Reddick's best sets. When I watched the film, I didn't think they ran that play all that well, or I didn't like that play. Why would I want my head coach telling every other team in the league, hey, look what we like to do? Because my coach's got bigger stones, and he's going to prove to everybody that he's going to win no matter you watch his podcast or not. Guess what? If he had a good enough team, maybe. His team stinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he's, he's got LeBron. He said he's got the best player in the world. He does, but he doesn't have anything else. And that's the problem. Hey, listen. Good for him. Getting that job, I think it's going to be a, uh, I don't know. I mean, I have no problem with him not having any coaching experience. Most of these guys, Jason Kidd doesn't have coaching experience. Steve Kerr didn't have coaching experience. Most guys don't have, like, that's what the NBA is now. It's just former players. Although I will say, Kidd was on his third job before he got to the NBA Finals. And Steve Kerr worked in an NBA front office before he got that job. So, you know, those guys at least had some sort of, you know, real-time experience before they had success. Right, but my point is you have to start somewhere. Like, you have to get that first job, you know? It's kind of tough when the first job's the Lakers, though. Well, that's the whole thing. It's the fact that it's the Lakers. But quite frankly, the Lakers have him in the Lakers for... They won that bubble championship, and other than that, they have not been very good. No, not since uh, Kobe and Gasol, basically. Yeah. Uh, Sports Pass Live, 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Uh, (laughs) We got uh, game seven tonight. Yes, sir. uh, Orioles. Oilers and the Panthers. The cover starts at 7.30. Stanley Cup, game seven. Probably one of the best moments in all sports, a Game 7 in the Stanley Cup. Although, I got to say, the hockey season, it's it's way too long. It is too long. I will I will admit that. But guess what? People are watching. Viewership is up, up, up across the board. And remember, we can't even include the Canadian viewers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the listeners are not uh, on your side on this one here. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not afraid. Come at me, bro. Well, they are. They are coming at you right now. All right, 547, we'll wrap up the show coming up next. You're listening to this. When it comes to Zaxby's Fingers, there's a few non-negotiables. It's got to be only premium tenderloin, marinated for 12 hours and fried to crispy perfection. What is negotiable? The flavors you create mixing our 12 signature sauces. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. With Mike Gill. And it just keeps getting better. On 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. All right, getting ready to get out of here on this uh, Monday night. Phil's in uh, Tigers tonight. It's uh, Nola getting the start for the Phil's. Was looking over at um, ESPN.com, players who stood out the most during minicamp. Isaiah Rogers was the uh, pick for the Eagles, which... uh, we were talking with Mosher during football at four today about some of the um, op- reason for optimism. And, you know, we brought up the secondary. That secondary room is going to be ridiculous. I mean, I don't understand how the – I don't know how they're going to – no, that's a podcast I would listen to. How are they deciphering between who stays and who goes in the Eagles secondary? Who would you like to hear on that podcast? The secondary coach. Okay. Maybe the defensive coordinator. Now, that would be selfish – Selfishly, I wouldn't want my team to do that. But I'm just saying, like, uh, if you saw this on Hard Knocks. You're saying I'm selfish. No, I didn't say that. I'm saying this. The, <laughs> I said before, content-wise, it would be great for a fan. Right. If I'm the team, I don't want my coach right. to. If you're the team, you don't want your coach talking to anybody. 
I wouldn't. certainly don't want them sitting around doing a podcast every week. Right. Giving away, you know. Giving away the like, keys uh, to the kingdom. Your assumption is that other teams are going to pick up on this. My assumption is don't assume that. My assumption I coach is, a lot of games, yeah. and I say to myself, how the hell did this coach not know this? Many times. <laughs> so don't assume that just because... You're right. Yeah. It's a bad job on me to assume that people actually know how to do their job. Well, I mean, and we don't know what they, they look for or what they're prioritizing. Which might be the wrong thing. Maybe. Uh, all right, tomorrow... We oh, will uh, be checking back to the Phils as uh, they got six lefties in the lineup. Phils are, are minus up. 185 tonight, by the way. I mean, that's like, <laughs> hello. Uh, I think uh, our intern, Hayden, is going to win a lot of money if Edmonton wins tonight. Unfortunately, I don't think you're going to win. I'm going Florida Panthers tonight. And I don't think it's particularly close. Wow. I think Edmonton's on all this work to get back. I think Edmonton falls short. They run out of gas. And the Florida Panthers hoist Lord Stanley. And the Canadian drought will continue. And the Panthers will get there first. Although I'm rooting for you. I want to be wrong on this one, Hayden. I want to be wrong. Check back tomorrow for Sports Bash Game 7 tonight on 97.3. When it comes to Zaxby's fingers, there's a few non-negotiables. It's got to be only premium tenderloin, marinated for 12 hours and fried to crispy perfection. What is negotiable? The flavors you create mixing our 12 signature sauces. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's.